All right, hola. Muchas gracias uh, por aceptar mi invitación para un podcast en profundidad. No, I really uh, hope that we're gonna have a very interesting discussion today. Jorge, thank you very much for joining us, amigo. Buenas noches. Thank you, for, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be talking to you. Of course. Uh, oh, as I mentioned a while ago, to be honest, I thought this should have come way earlier. But I also thought this is an interesting time for having us, for you know, for having a discussion about Philippines, Spain, and everything else in the context of what you also wrote about uh, the other week and what I also attended uh, the other week, which is, you know, really honoring of Rizal and his contribution to Spanish language literature, uh, the event that happened, of course, the other week in uh, Instituto Cervantes, which you have been very much affiliated with uh, for many years. So I just thought this is a perfect time, amigo, for us to talk to each other. And I'm glad that you have no problem with my Real Madrid <laughs> logo there on my cap. <laughs> yeah. So, Jorge, uh, first of all, as we as we do in our podcast here, because these are long-form discussions, it's not just, as we say it in Filipino, pakyut, no? or just for some few buzzwords. First of all, can you tell me a little bit about uh, yourself, uh, Jorge? You know, you know, like, you know, your background and how you ended up in the Philippines and what you're up to in the past few years, right? Well, you know, I I, I travel a lot in my life, but uh, the, I, I ended here. I arrived to the Philippines two weeks before Ondoy, right? Oh. So in September 2009, that's when I arrived. And I came here to, I work for the Spanish government, actually, but in the cultural section, which is Instituto Cervantes, right? right. right. This is uh, like, it's a cultural center of Spain. We have branches all over the world. And we, of course, we have one in Manila. Um, since then, you know, I have been doing many things here. I try to, I, I started to research about Philippine literature. Yes. And book history and colonial literature and um, Philippine literature in Spanish. And I, I also teach literature in university. I, I collaborate with Vival Foundation, the, right. the publishing house. And also I publish every every Tuesday, I publish an article, a column in, uh, in Manila Times. Right, right. Oh, just to be clear, so your background is both historiador and also uh, literati? Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. no, no, not at all. My my background is uh, Latin American studies. <laughs> Latin, so it's it's a it's a comprehensive area studies, right? In that sense. Well, actually, my, my, I I started with with Latin American literature, and then you know I moved here, and right. I realized that there is so much thing to. It's like a big niche where nobody entered before. I mean, very yes. few people entered. Right. I said there are so many writers in Spanish here, and, and since the Filipinos stop talking the language, so there are right. people paying attention to do authors that were excellent, right. really excellent. That's why I, if they were bad, I wouldn't pay attention to them, but they were right. they were good. So I decided, okay, I think this is interesting to to rescue uh, uh, these people. Huh? Uh, by the way, they were very patriotic. All of them. It's it's, it's a very uh, it's a very uh, curious thing. No, they use Spanish to to promote. Um, Filipino nationalism, no? <laughs> right. It's a paradox. No, exactly. Like turning the empire against itself, right? Or kind of uh, a dialectic yes. jiu-jitsu, right? Uh, we see that a lot with India also using, you know, Gandhi was using English language against the British Empire and all. I want to talk more about this. I mean, what was your impression of, of the Philippines before coming to the Philippines? And what are the things, what are the things that you have confirmed with your own experience and what are the things that you perhaps felt should be demystified and have been demystified in, in terms of your own experience? Because just to be honest about this, uh, Jorge, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding between our two nations, right? Uh, and, and I always say both sides have their, some chip on their shoulders when we deal with each other, if there's no proper background, understanding and compassion, right? I think, I think on the part of the Philippines, you know, we have a lot of, of course, negative perception of the Spanish heritage, uh, thanks to novels of Rizal, among others, and also how Americans discussed the Spanish heritage uh, when you know they colonized the Philippines. But at the same time, I, I, I also sense that in Spain, there's also some chip on the shoulders of people when they deal with the Philippines because they feel like, oh, these Filipinos, they we we you know they had three hundred years of shared history with us, and they don't even bother to speak our language. We're kind of out of the radar, <laughs> and, and at the same time, they don't also yeah. feel much connection with us because you know when Espanol okay, they come here, like they see it kind of a very Americanized country, right? 
I mean, I could say Puerto Rico is the closest to that, but Puerto Rico just ke still kept the Spanish language and heritage in which, which the Philippines did not. So it's really a, a bizarre situation where both sides have some, you know, misgivings about each other. But obviously that easily breaks down whenever I dealt with our Espanol friends that are in here, whether in, in, in España, etc. But I just realized that the, there's a, some sort of uneasiness that goes with familiarity which makes a very unique relationship, right? It's both especial and at the same time complicado, right? They kind of go together. <laughs> yeah, sorry for that. I just had to be <laughs> set the tone yes, of yes, the discussion I want us to have. Yes, amigo, please. Let's let's start from, you know, let's say that, that, that um, what what the, what the Spaniards or what I thought about the Philippines before, right? right? Before coming here, this is the, the first thing. And I, to, to be honest, um, uh, my perception is that there is a lot of ignorance in Spain regarding Filipinos. Right. Okay, I mean, right. I mean, many countries, many countries. If you go to some countries, they they, they identify Filipinos for being immigrants. But to be honest, Filipinas is not. I mean, Spain is not. A, it's not a country with a lot of Filipinos, comparatively speaking. Right? If you go to Italy or you go to England, you will find more. Right? Right. Right. So, for example, in the Fili in Italy, they identify uh, a Filipina is also is almost a synonym of being a maid, right? right. But, so for example, in Spain, yeah, in Spain we identify they are famous, for example, in Madrid, Filipinos for being good chefs, right? They, they right. Cook Cocinero. excellently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, they cook excellently. So actually, you know, they they hire a lot of Filipino chefs. This is what this. So, but this is not a this is not a big community. There are there is some. Filipino immigrants in Madrid and Barcelona because those are the two big, two bigger, two bigger cities with more opportunities, of course, and employment. But to be honest, because we don't have too much content. To be honest, the first right. Filipino I saw in my life is when I went to the Philippine embassy in Madrid to, uh, to ask for my visa. I right. never met one before. Yes. Right. right. So, and, you know, I knew certain things. I knew that people don't speak Spanish here anymore. I knew, you know, because you know, I have some intellectual curiosity. I read Rizal. Yes, but you, you know, I read only old, right? You said you read Rizal when you were twenty-one years old, so you were yeah, 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 but, college, uh, right? Or going uh, for your? I, yeah. I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know. I I did it for pleasure. You know, I I went to okay, you know, let's see what the what the Filipinos wrote, and then I found that it was the easier thing to find, you know, in right. in a second hand uh, second hand uh, bookstore. Yes, so I read it, but you know, I read it without knowing the context at all. Correct. You know. For me, it was you know, I, I read a romance <laughs> right. with a bad, with a with with an unhappy end. So right. and I had fun. I said, "Whoa, well, wow, this guy writes so well, you know." And he she, he was born so far. He writes better than me. So right. I was too surprised that, that you know the quality of the of the prose, you know, the prose of of Rizal. But to be honest, I wanted, I, I read many things once I was appointed to to work here. Right. But uh, you know, generally speaking, the Spaniards don't know too much about Filipinos or about Philippine history. They don't know what happened later. They don't know that the, the Philippines has a um, had an American period, you know. Unless you are a person who loves history, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah people, people usually identify the Philippines with calamities, you know, because this is what we see in the news. Yeah. Right. I remember when I was a child, like you know, that this Etza. I was six mm. years old, and I remember, I remember Etza because you choose Corazon Aquino, right? And then for a Spaniard to have a person with the name Corazon, you know, right, right. It's like you have hearts. Like, yeah. You have, yeah, you have a person with the name Puso, no? Yeah. So exactly. it was like, yeah, it was like what exotic name, no? I yeah. say, oh, so and then I remember that I remember Etza because of Corazon Aquino, right? right? And then I remember so I watched a document, a, a very sad documentary about people people selling. Um, Organs, like they, but voluntarily, right. they, they were <laughs> selling in Laguna pieces of their uh, kidneys. Right, right. So, but it was I was 14, 15 years old or something, yes. Yeah. So I remember also it caught also the attention of, of Spaniards. You see a person whose name is Joselito Garcia, but does not know a word of Spanish, no? Right. So right, it's, a, it's, right. it's, a, it's a kind of short, like, a, and people is wondering what happened. So the, the problem is ignorance, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's really ignorance. So, so that's why I, I believe but that anything that is... ignorance come with lack of interest too, right? I mean, if you're interested in something, <clears throat> find something interesting, you'll read more about it, right? So it, it looks like there's kind of a mutual alienation and lack of interest, right? Because if you talk to a lot of Filipinos, unless you're also really into Spain, 
or you're familiar with the language, there's also a lot of ignorance about Spain. I mean, the fact that there's so many few Filipinos in Spain, right? And most of them are, I don't know, in Italy or England, uh, which kind of doesn't make sense because from what I understand, Spain is a much more welcoming place. I mean, no offense to those other countries. And in fact, if you want to be on track to citizenship or long-term immigration, Spain looks to be a much more welcoming place, right? I mean, I can say that from the experience of my family members who used to be in Italy, some of them have settled already in Spain, etc. So, and not to mention talking to a lot of overseas Filipinos who are saying, you know, if you want to really immigrate to Europe, right? Spain is not only a gateway, it could be your final destination and home in these places. So I just felt that this kind of ignorance is really, really mutual. I think in the Philippines, probably we only the only politician we know from your country is like, I don't know, Franco, and not a Franco because he's like our version of Marcos, right? Although we can debate about the true legacy of that. Like Pedro Sanchez, who are your prime minister right now, I think he's far more, uh, you know, charismatic and I think progressive than Macron or even, you know, Justin Trudeau and all. But you know, no one knows about who's like the latest prime minister government in, in Spain, here in the Philippines, right? I notice people get more uh, interested if I talk about French politics, right? Or uh, Macron or Le Pen or whether I talk about Russia, China. So mm. the frustration you have is, yeah, I have the same frustration that I don't think we're paying as much attention to Spain. And of course, to top it all, we're not a football nation, right? Jorge, I think if we were a football nation, we would pay more attention to España because it's just so hard to ignore Real Madrid and Barcelona, not to mention Atletico uh, Madrid, right? It's becoming, it's becoming a, a more football nation slowly. There are more more people who like football slowly, yeah. right? Maybe you guys can help help with that. I notice also there are like very few Spanish in the Philippines, right? Or even people of real Spanish heritage, right? Like some of us have Spanish heritage, but it's really, really minimal. And a lot of us... Our Spanish names are Basque or Catalan, right? I think in 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 case in my mom's case, Foronda, I think it's a Basque name, right? It's not it's not a Castilian or or, or Catalan name. So it's that also makes the Philippines different, right, from many Latin American countries, right? Uh, well, I wouldn't say you know this is something that is being repeated all the time that most of the yeah. immigrants came from Basque country, but I don't I don't think that is true if you look at the stats. Mm, interesting. And, no, I'm talking I about uh, the, the pre-1848 or, or pre-Mexican independence period, right? Because from what I understand, more diverse immigration came in after Mexico was uh, independent. Because let's not forget, I mean, Philippines was ruled via Mexico, right? Until Mexican independence in early 19th century. So but from what I understand, the, please correct me, because my, from what I understand, the context is that it was very hard for a lot of Spaniards to make it to the Philippines. I remember Portugal and others controlled the Indian Ocean, whatever. So most of the Spaniards were actually going, the enterprising Spaniards would go to, I don't know, Argentina, to Latin America, Mexico, whatever. And then really that the Spanish who came to the Philippines are, you know, for lack of a politically correct term, like the more rugged versions, right? Who would bother to come but, to but the Philippines? Is, you know, this is a myth completely. That the, the low yeah, quality... exactly. So can you can you tell us about the numbers and data? That's why I want to have this conversation with you. Yeah, it is not true that the the, the low quality Spaniards came here or low quality people from Mexico <laughs> came here. It's, right, not, right. it's not true. I mean, there were a few thousand uh, people from during a period the way there was a period that like two thousand three thousand people were brought from New, New Spain from New Spain, which which was Mexico. Ah, uh, Mexico. Yeah, yeah. But. But you know, Philippines was never like Australia. That it was like the prison, no, of of UK. Yeah. No, you send the people there. It never happened here. And to be honest, you look at the stats. Most of the people who came here were actually from Andalusia, which is my region. Ah, interesting. Interesting. The thing is, you know, what, why why people think that the Basque are the majority? Because Basque surnames are easy to identify. Mm, right, right, right. Basque surnames, surnames are easy to identify. But if you say Garcia, or you say Romero, and you say yeah. you can be from anywhere, yeah, right? Anywhere. So, right. but, but it, it it is not true. I look at the stats; it's twenty five percent of people, which is normal because that region is very small, right? In the north area, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's only one million and a half people today, right? right. So, so it's not really. Uh, it's true that some of them became prosperous, no? Like the you know Ayala's. Uh, right. the, Ayala, yes, but Ayala in the origin, Ayala, the, 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 the prosperity of the Ayala does not come from the Basque side. Right. It comes from the German. There, Swiss. Who, the, first, yeah, yeah. the Zobel. German Swiss who, yeah. who right. opened a first pharmacy in Manila. Right. 
Right, right. Yeah, right. so you know, like any any monopoly, you are the first one to open a pharmacy, so you you become very prosperous. Right. And then the Rojas family, which actually became came from from Mexico. See? Right. So they're the Nova. So Ayala was a soldier. Very... Ayala was a soldier, a lucky soldier. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, here, I like this because this is what I like uh, discussing. Although we'll go to the literacy numbers because I remember a few years ago we had some. Uh, not the most spirited exchanges, but some, you know, like some back and forth, polite discussion on the literacy issue. But before that, can you, so so you were saying um, a third, roughly a third of the Spaniards in the Philippines who settled in the Philippines throughout the 300 years came from the Basque region. Well, which is not small because Basque is such a small part of Spain. So it's disproportionate, right? Dispro and of course, because the names are doesn't sound, so I, from what I understand, Foronda is more, it's a Basque name. It's not a Spanish name. But what you're saying, and, and this is confirmed by my own conversation with, with some family members who are saying a lot of Filipinos who came from Spain are, I, I, I heard the term more Moorish, which kind of makes sense because if you're talking about Andalusia, right, this was the more, uh, again, I know it, it, it's super wrong, right? It's politically incorrect, right? But you know what? You know what? Those areas this were is, conquered by Moors, right? Yeah, yes, yes. I mean, we, that's why when I say we, you know, sometimes some people, Filipino people are a bit obsessed with blood, no? Right, 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 right. right, right. Yeah. For example, even I, I, I read some com bad comments about you because you are not fully blooded Filipino. You have, have some Iranian or Armenian right, ancestry. Right, and right. It, it's like, and they, are, they are saying that you are less legitimate to talk about the Philippines for exactly. that reason. It's completely, it's completely irrational. Right. Right. So, so I remember one day they asked me, La Salle, I'm fully blooded Spaniard. And I said, well, you know, you combine the Iberian roots, the Roman Empire, the Visigoths, right. and the, the Muslims, the Jewish, the Amerindians, and you make a cocktail, this halo halo. Yes, I'm, I'm fully blooded Spaniard. You come, and they were not happy with my answer. Huh. You know, I was trying to explain that I'm a genetically a mix of all, all the people exactly. who passed through the Iberian Peninsula. And that's it. Right. What, what is the problem with that? I think but they, they, the this, American legacy or something like that, this this obsession about, right? I mean, if you look at America, they have a very strong sense of identity and race, right? And I think that has a lot to do with the slavery, like all this hyphenated American, Italian-American, African-American, Asian-American, all of that. Probably think, it's an American I influence, think, huh? I believe, I believe it's not a foreign thing. I believe this is an indigenous thing where, uh, you know, uh, right. in, a, in, in, in indigenous culture, lineage, right? Who's your father? Who's your grandfather? Right, Those right. kind of things. And uh, who do you call it? Lahi? In, in Lahi right, no? Yes, exactly. Race, yeah, or lineage. Yes, it's, it's, it's a lineage. Actually, the, the, the literal meaning of Lahi is not race, it's right. lineage. lineage right, so yes. knowing your ancestry explains who you are. And you know, in, in the, the Philippine society, pre Hispanic society, even it was not a caste society like India, but there were social classes. Yes, and it was very difficult to 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 mix. Okay, the Timao, right. the Timawa, the Maharlika, the Maharlika, you know, they only you know. So so I think you really have to bring the Maharlika one. No? <laughs> yeah. Now every now everybody here identify with the Maharlika, but to be yeah, honest, yeah. you know, I don't let me know anything. <laughs> I I like that. I I like your answer. You, you're actually right. You know, this is what I found paradoxical about us Filipinos is that. At once, I found us Filipinos very cosmopolitan. Uh, you know, the amount we don't see the kind of ethnocentrism or xenophobia in the you know in Philippines, which we see in I won't name names, but many other Asian countries, right? I mean, we can complain yeah. about you know. So Philippines, I think, are way more welcoming of different lahi, you no, know, or or mi admixtures yeah. are lahi than, than let's be honest, a lot of Northeast Asian countries, right? You you know which countries they are, you no? Know, when in, in, if you're not let's say, full Japanese or whatever, like there's a different treatment yeah. of you, whether it's half white, half whatever, it doesn't matter. There is that discrimination. So in the Philippines, usually there's a positive discrimination, in fact, for those who have foreign blood, especially from Caucasian or more light skinned blood. At the same time, though, whenever the discussions get heated political, religious, suddenly you see this discussion about, oh, you're not a true, you know, a true Filipino, is a Moreno Filipino, a true Filipino, you know what I'm saying? And then and then you see suddenly all of these racist comments come out, right? You know, whether you're from South Asia, Middle East or, or Europe. Yeah, and so I found that really weird. Like it's, it's, it's that, you know, there it's, it's kind of a, 
subcutaneous kind of semi-racism at the same time very open cosmopolitanism that I don't see in other regions but this is my impression also and I get it of course from my father's impression and my non-Filipino you know kind of relatives and all what about you or friends yeah what about you I mean, my, my impression is that some, with, with this issue of race, of, of, of this idea of um, um, purity, you know, racial purity, is, is something that, that is, you know, you, people take the photo finish of, of, of the time of the conquest. Huh? See it. And, you know, they don't understand that, yeah. that the Hispanic Philippines is a consequence of many other things, of many human migrations before. Right. Right. right? Well, we, we have been, you know, so it's not that the, um, the, the Filipino race is something that uh, is only that, you know, before yeah. it was different. We have the IEPA people, you know, you are in communication with many people, with China, the That's massive right. traders, et cetera, et cetera. So the Philippines was, was not a closed place. Absolutely. It was a place where people were trading. And, and you know, it's, it's normal to 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 meet with, to, to, to have uh, racial mixes, you know. And, right. I mean, I mean I don't know. And the Jorge, thing is, yeah. No, I mean, Jorge, if you talk to geneticists and all, they'll say the word race doesn't exist, right? It's it's a social construct, right? Because genetically speaking, you know, like we're all Homo sapiens, right? And in terms of our DNA and all, there's not really much difference. So, I mean, the issue no, of race is really actually scientifically questionable, right? If you really want to go down, no, the, road, right? yeah. The, the, the racial differences for in, in fight, according to scientists are negligible. You cannot, you yeah. know, it's exactly. so small that you cannot take it in consideration. I mean, what matters is culture. It's what exactly. matters at the end. Exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, Jorge, you have been here since 2009, right? Uh, have, have, I mean, so much changed just in the last decade in the Philippines, right? I mean, I'm I, I'm not trying to have a recency bias, but my sense is the past decade in the Philippines has been one of the most transformative, tumultuous, exciting, depressing, and and you know, <laughs> bewildering one, if I could put it that way. Just look at our political scene. At the same time, the economic scene, right? We see a transformation of the city and the country in good and bad ways. But I want to get your point of view as an as a Spaniard, as someone has come to develop passion and love for the Philippines. I can see that in your writings, in 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 the way you pay attention to the country. I understand personally, you are also invested in this country, of course. Um, can you tell me about your impression? Uh, has the Philippines changed over the past decade uh, in, in ways that is worth mentioning? Or is this a, what some Americans say is a, the changeless country or changeless land, as some derisively put it? What no, is your no, no. I think that the, yes, the, the things are, are changing, but... The, I mean, I mean, you 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 see more prosperity in the country, and you see uh, more middle class, right? Yes, um, and you see more little pockets of of more you know more level places like you know like BGC or Makati or you know you, or you see certain or... things right that that are improving. No salaries are going up too, right? right? So, but still, my my opinion is that. That is not main. In, in, there are many things missing, especially from the point of view of poverty reduction, because where the country, the, the economy of the country, I think right now, Philippines is the 39th biggest economy in the world. By, right? by nominal, but purchasing power part, I think it's top 30 or top 25. Yes, yes. Yeah, even bigger. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. But still, you know, even by, by, by per capita, it's, it's the same as Moldova. Right, right. Right. Which is which is the poorest country in, in, in Europe, I think, no? So right. because of course it is an overpopulated overpopulated country, right? So um my opinion is that things are, are, are changing, but at the same time, you know, uh, uh you know, you know that you I, th I think you will disagree with me, but I, I, I believe that you know some of the uh, big problems come from the the elite. The, I mean, the, I, I believe that the, the, the Philippine elite and the political and economic elite mm -hmm. is not uh, as good as, as it should be. Right? If you right. look at the, the political system, it's a bit rigid and does not allow people for, you know, like anyone, you know, you need to belong to certain families to, to in order to enter there. Yes, and, right. and then in the, in the, from the economic side, you see that most of the more, most profitable businesses are rent seeking. Right. I mean, malls is rent seeking, uh, state is rent seeking, so it's not a very productive way of 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 of, of, of generating profit for the country in a long in a, in a long term. It's not sustainable even because right. the the land is limited. 
Right. And you see the, the biggest the biggest companies here, what, what do they have? Commodities, basic commodities, like uh, phone, uh, water, uh, electricity. Extractive. You know, so, um, so, you know, yeah, so I think, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, sometimes it's not exactly that. I wouldn't say that the, the so in somehow the, 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 the Philippine economy is somehow still colonial. In the sense that it's a, there are a lot of uh, a lot of monopolies that are being protected by law, right? So in that way, so that's why, for example, Filipinos pay uh, for for internet, you know, uh, too much. Right. For, especially if you if you consider the the quality of the internet you get, don't you? I mean, you pay the same price as in Spain, right? But you know the salaries here are not like in Spain, no. Or you go to the supermarket in Spain, how much is a can of beer? Way cheaper it's water is way than cheaper. here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, way cheaper in the. Right. Well, yes. So you know, we, we have like you know, we have like I don't know how many local brands, like ten, right. and then we have a lot of foreign brands. So they are competing, right? And here is there is no real competition. Right. So that that Filipinos pay a lot. That that uh, affects the the capacity of, of Filipinos to save money. Right. 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 Because they, it's not only the salaries are short. It's that the things are even more expensive than in a Spanish or Italian supermarket. True. So it's completely absurd. Though. Even one kilo of rice, one kilo of rice is cheaper in Spain in the supermarket. It's completely absurd. So those things, I, I don't know how to, uh, I believe in, in developing countries like in the Philippines, the business people are used to get a profit margin Very, that, that yeah. at the end of the day is causing, uh, the, um, you know, it's causing that to, to how do you call it? To, to, um, you know, it's 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 a slowing, no? How do you call it? to make slow, no? It's slowing the capacity of the country to to eliminate poverty, no? Because um, basic things like chicken, rice, eggs are very expensive, no? This is what I, I mean. So, I believe it should uh, even even if you don't want to open the, the economy to foreign companies, it should you should stimulate the uh, competition inside the country. Right, right. No, I mean I, for me. The, mm. Yeah, a lot of Filipinos, I mean, in Spain and Europe say they save money actually by staying there in terms of their daily food expenses and all, right? As long as you find a pretty decent place to rent, uh, in terms of, you know, a proper meal in, in yeah, paella in, in, in Madrid, it's going to cost you way lower than a comparable paella in a mid-range decent restaurant in Manila, right? So I really found that ridiculous. I remember I just got a huge bucket of water. It was like 25 cents, no? I mean, like... And in, in Philippines, it's going to be at least 1.5 euros, right? I mean, the difference is just insane. Right? I couldn't believe, like, I said, maybe this is expired water or something. I couldn't believe how cheap it was. It's actually even, I, I found Madrid's cheaper than Paris, than, than many Italian cities from Rome, Firenze, and definitely also cheaper than Germany, although Berlin. So, like, I found Spain not only more affordable than Philippines, but also more affordable than major capitals, comparable capitals in Europe, which was, is it because it's subsidized? What's going on there? Was there, there's a price regulation? What's no, no, no. There? no it's, it's, I, I think that, that it's, it's, the, the, it's because of, um, in the case of the Philippines, particularly the reason is bad urban planning. Sure. I mean, I mean, lack of urban planning, I'll say. Why? Because the good areas to live are, are like bubbles. Right, right. Right? So it's not like, it's not like in, in, in Spain, you, every, in every barrio, in every street, you can potentially open a business. But here, no. If you want to sell and you have to launch a business, you go to the malls, right? Uh, you cannot... It's many, you cannot. Yeah, so there are many squatters areas. There are many subdivisions here. You, sure. cannot, you cannot open a business there. You should you should open a business where there are like um, high-rise buildings or something like that, no? So in, in Spain or in Paris or, you know, in Europe, generally, <laughs> there is more mid-rise mid -rise building, right? Right, and right. there is a lot, of, and there is a lot of um, middle class, right? So this is what helps the economy to be more uh, dynamic and and not going here because of this bad urban planning. The ones who own right. these lands that are well planned, like for example BGC, are the ones that are making really money. Right. But if you make good urban planning all over the city, you know there were more distribution, right? They will be they will be more, more distributed. It's the concentration of the land. In a few hands, is causing uh, this high um, a lot of high prices here. 
But Jorge, you you are in you know you you are a specialist in Latin America. Wouldn't you say we see very similar yes. circumstances in Latin America? I mean, and all the things you say, I can just replace the word with Mexico or Peru or I don't know, not maybe as much in Argentina. I mean, there are a lot of similarities, right? Can you talk, tell us about the parallels between Latin America and Philippines you see and differences, perhaps, of course? Well, the 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 the, the parallelisms are more culture and behavior, no? Like, you know, mm -hmm. food, family, religion, sense of humor, right? <laughs> so, you know, as my, some of the Filipinos who live in Latin America, they live in Chile or in Mexico. Right. Once they come back and then they want to roll in, in Cervantes because they want to, you know, they don't want to lose the Spanish language that they learn, right? So they want to enroll just to keep practicing. And they told me that they feel like at home. Right. They feel like, like at home. They didn't feel... The, probably the only difference is that uh, uh, in Latin America, people is more European in the sense we, they are more straightforward. You know, mm -hmm. Filipinos are more Asian. You know, they don't sometimes you have to guess what the person is thinking. Sometimes the Filipinos don't want to. Filipinos sometimes don't want to say what they don't want to say what they think because they are afraid of offending another person, right? Angonized. So yeah, yes. But I, I have to say that, for example, the the the. The messy urban planning that you find in Metro Manila, you don't find it in in Latin America. So you, you right? have better been... urban planning. You are saying, let's say, in you know, in major Mexican cities or major Latin America. Yes, yes. Oh, well, you, you you talk to the Mexican people and they will tell you that they thought they thought that the own city were messy until they came here. They come here <laughs> like yeah, yeah. But speaking of that, yeah. Speaking of yes. that, a good friend of. I suppose you're also familiar with him. I mean, the late Carlos Seldran also emphasized this a lot. And we have a new big book also about it. Is it James Scott Rampage, which also explains that a big part of the fact that Manila tends to lack the kind of urban planning grandeur and heritage that many Latin American countries have is also because of what happened in the twilight days of Second World War. Now, again, I'm not excusing the messy governance afterwards, but really much of Manila was totally devastated in ways that many Latin American cities never were, right? Or even some Spanish cities were never. I mean, like Manila was, I think, the third most devastated city during the Second World War. I mean, the Americans dropped yeah, so many bombs, destroyed much of the heritage of Manila. What about that aspect? Again, I'm not uh, expecting you know, that urban planning. Yep, yeah. This is something that had been listening many times, but I, I have to disagree, you know, when uh, mm. the, the Philippines in the 50s and the, and the 60s was, you know, you look at pictures and even videos, there are a lot of videos in YouTube, was a wonderful place to live, really. I mean, it was destroyed, but the streets were there. The sidewalks were there. The parks were there, you know. So there are, in, in my opinion, the, the, the mess of Metro Manila uh, is a combination of different factors, right? It's not only it's not only one, but I mean, in my opinion, the, the number one factor is the political culture, right? right? I, you know, I, I I remember I remember I I will tell you something. I remember one day I was in Malati in a bar, right? And uh, you know, <laughs> a member of a very a member of a very famous political party, yes. And we start talking. No, I I, I won't tell his surname. Okay, I, and you know, since I'm a foreigner, so he was very open. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, no, I won't, ahead, tell, I won't tell you. I won't tell you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Just... Another day with a beer. Another day with a beer. I will tell you. So he was explaining <laughs> me all, all, the, all the things he was, uh, he was, he was complaining about Filipino people all the time. You know, Filipinos are happy, go lucky, and he said, you know, why you don't make urban planning? I, to I told him, I told him, listen, it's fine. You know, you can, you can be like Lee Kuan Yew. You, you steal a bit of money. But then you provide to the people, so no one will complain at the end, right? <laughs> so you, you you do you do things for the people, and then if you are a, a little bit corrupt, nobody nobody will complain because yeah. you know you delivered so much to the people. And he told me, yes, but you cannot be reelected. <laughs> so basically, his idea the is that you know when is you bad are for power, politics, yeah, yeah, when you are in power, you have to take as much as possible because later <laughs> you won't you won't have any other chance. So it's, I was, and he I remember. Remember, he he defined himself as a politician. In, in Spain, nobody would say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you are, sure you, are any, you can, you will be a lawyer, and then you eventually can like it's it's, it's considered like a temporary public service. It's right. not a job. Right. Yes. But here, he, he, 
Yes. So, I, so, so I believe. Yes. Yes, please, please go ahead. No, 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 please go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, there's just Basically, slight delay. That's why. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. So if you look and now, you can see very well with Google Maps, you know, what how is Metro Manila, you know? And you see there are not, for example, public spaces or green areas almost, you know, actually the biggest green area is a golf uh, golf park. Yeah. So, Big green area. You, so what, what happened, you know, I think that it's, um, when a politician here, a mayor here is elected, they, they treat their city like their own property. So they keep selling land, yes. They don't. They don't. They are not. They are thinking about to make money. So what? How can you make money? So you 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 build condos and you make malls. You know, you make a park. What what is the, the profit for you and your family? Nada, not zero. Right. So it's, it's a, a, that's why you know now there is no land free to do anything anymore. So you need to create, make a more creative ways to to make money. There are I read I heard that there are some mayors who are thinking to sell the steros. <laughs> because, because, because there is no land available to sell. See, yeah. And you know the Manila Bay reclamation. What is that? What is that? They, they, they don't have more land to do, so they create. They want to increase the. It's, it's a question of greed, really. It's a question of greed, right? So that's the that's the you know one of the the things is uh, the political culture is uh, sadly horrible. No? I think yeah. I think Filipinos deserve better. Political culture. I mean. Um, you know, we, in the Philippines, you have a long history of caudillismo, right? I mean, starting with uh, Aguinaldo, right? The kind of our first caudillo. And that culture has, has been there for quite some time. And if you look at the numbers, one of the reasons the Philippines was left behind was because the next caudillo, Marco Senior, right? Uh, you know, he may have done something here and there, but we can clearly see the Philippines was left behind by the time he left office in the mid-1980s. I'm talking about facts, not, you know, uh, you know, the, fantasies and disinformation here um but that caudillismo culture is very similar to what you had in latin america you know general franco in the case of spain openly said he's a caudillo you know uh, what about the again I, i'm not here to blame spain per se but i just find it fascinating for for a spanish person with now roots also in the philippines talking about this uh so my sense is don't you see also some sort of connection to the Spanish heritage here? As much as, of course, there are many other things we have to talk about. The Datu culture in the pre-Hispanic era, the kind of politician careerism that Americans brought here. But what about the role of Spain? Didn't uh, Spain contribute also to this kind of caudillismo culture? Big caudillo, small caudillo. It's very clear the way our well, politicians well, are well, caudillo, right? Yeah. But, but, you know, the, the thing is, the thing is, what, what Spain is based, Spain did, uh, did not well is that you know they chose the principales you know in, ah, in the colonial right. period right so they, they needed they needed to have a, 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 a indigenous person local right. who will be in control of the population but at the same time it supports spain okay but yeah. i think there has been a transformation and uh, I, I i think there has been a philippinization of that phenomenon and uh, you know, and 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 in what so is the Filipinization? The Filipinization is the, the strong role of the family, right? Which is a strong, stronger. You know, the, the the family bounds here are way way stronger than is in Spain or Latin America, right? Sure. So you know, this yeah. family, how do you call that? Family dynasties, no? Dynasties, yes. It's a very Filipino. It's a very Filipino phenomenon that you don't find so often. You, sometimes in that, but not so often like here. That even you can identify. By province, which are the two, right. three families competing? Right. You don't fight. You don't find that anywhere in Mexico, for example, right. or in Spain, right? So, and then you have you have this thing. This so even sometimes I read news that are are very funny from my point of view. You know, uh, uh, for example, someone commit a crime or a little thing, and and the, and the judge gives a very little punishment. Because and because uh, this person stole because it was for the family, you know, mm -hmm. like it was right. not abandoned. <laughs> so he's a hero, right? Sorry. The, the punishment, the... not really a hero, but it's not so it's not so bad because he did not steal things for himself, but yeah, yeah, yeah. for the family. Right. right so right. the family justifies many things you know, because here you provide to the family. You are like you know. So there is a. You know, this is a, something that I studied Niels Mulder, this anthropologist, yes. no? Yes. So there are things... He has Hispanic, yeah, yeah. He studied that, no? How, what, what, one of the problems of the social cohesion of the Philippines is that sometimes right. in the public space, 
Public space is, is interpreted as an area where you can find to provide to your family. Right. So there is no solidarity with people with people that does not belong to your family. No. So the real nation for many Filipinos is the family and the barcada, right? Right. So um, and then you have other things that also contribute to corruption, like uh, utana no. Right. Yes. We have we have. We have something in Spain too. We have this sentence like "Hoy por ti, mañana por mí," no? Right, right, Today right. for you scratch and tomorrow back. for you. Your back is so, scratch, scratch kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, "tan up can be good in certain contexts, of course, but yeah. you, you in the political context, it's, it's a it's a very bad thing, right? So, I mean, there are things that are from a Western influence, but at the same time, you know, it's not that you have to take in consideration the the the, the native agency, right? right? It's like me, and culpability. Okay, the culpability. Yeah. Yes, you have you you take institutions and laws, right, and everything that you inherited from foreign powers, but then you you use it, you you interpret it in your own way, right? So it's not it's not so it's not so easy. It's very complex, and I I believe this is for me very fascinating. Yeah. Right. Really, it's not. You look, let let let's look at religion, right. Mm -hmm. you know, Filipinos are Catholic, but the, the Filipinos have a very particular way of being Catholic that I find it very, you know, uh, interesting. No, they interpret, uh, uh, you know, they do devotions in their own way, in a very original way, right? So right. It's, I, I find it very, you know, interesting. So it kind of indigenized aspect to that. Well, I mean, for me, okay, this is also the kind of kind of counter argument. Like if you look at the Philippines, it's very similar to Indonesia, Malaysia. Nusantara South Asia in terms of its pre-colonial culture, right? And yet, uh, those countries which are products of Dutch colonialism or let's say uh, British colonialism, we don't see the prevalence of political dynasty in certain patterns as much as we see in the Philippines. Do you get what I'm saying? Because if your argument is, and I kind of agree with you, that you know, don't just look at the colonial era, look at the pre-colonial cultures and their persistence, my, my, my argument would be, I get that, but why is the Philippines way worse than a lot of its neighbors, including Malaysia, you know, and, and Indonesia, which have relatively democratic systems, but they don't have as much family-centric politics. So maybe there was uh, an aspect of colonial influence there. Maybe not Spanish. And I, of course, I would argue it's more American probably. But but do you get what I'm saying? So I, as, as much as I agree with your native agency, I mean, indigenous agent, agency and culpability argument, I think there was also something unique about the Philippines' colonial experience that created this kind of outcome, which we don't see in Malaysia and Indonesia and very, very similar countries mm -hmm. here in Southeast Asia. Do you get what I'm saying here? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's also the angle. I'm yes, using. yes, yes. But, but, but I believe that, you know, the um, also, uh, I don't know what happened after the 50s or the 60s, but it, it seems that the, 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 the Philippine state was not able to, to be uh, very strong, right? right? You know, right. It, if the, if, the, if the state is strong, if the state can provide, people don't need to they don't need to go to the family, right? right. Because you know you get a job, you you create your family and your own, you get married and you have your own life, no. But this clannish way of interpreting politics maybe has to be something to do with the weakness of the state, right? right. But it's only a hypothesis. I, I'm I'm not sure. Eh? I'm not sure. I right. mean, my Malaysia, it seems that Malaysia, since independence, has grown as a more uh, stronger state, no? Which with, they you know, say that, is that... British legacy, which they say it's more British legacy in ways that we didn't have with Americans and Spain and all. I mean, but okay, we can go on with this topic forever, but I want us to transition to it, another important topic, which is, you know, of course, you have written extensively on that, Illustrados, etc. But before going there, uh, Amigo, can you tell me what are what, what do you think are the, let's say, five biggest myths or misconceptions about Spanish uh, legacy and, and heritage as far as the Philippines is concerned that really riles you up, right? So I think you already pointed out one or two in our discussion a while ago, and I'm very glad. That's why I really want to talk to you. Uh, can you, if top five, let's say, top five or top three biggest annoying <laughs> and, and let's say poisonous, toxic kind of misconceptions there that really riles you up, not only as a Span Espanol, but as a scholar, right? Who bothered to do his research and look at the numbers and data, etc. Can you do that? If we're going to make a reel of like one minute reel, right? Like, can you tell us what are the three or five major myths about Spanish legacy in the Philippines that really, really riles you up? Well, you know, it's, 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 
it, it's not really to to say the opposite. It's like to be more no, nuanced. Nuanced, you know? exactly. Right, right, right. To be more nuanced. Like, like you know, I can give you a, a very fun example. When I was here teaching Spanish, one one girl when at the end of the course, she came to me and approached me and told me. Jorge, you are such a good person. I, I, I said, why you shouldn't why shouldn't I be? She said, because you are a stealer. Oh, like, that's you that's know, that's you know, it's like, it's like, you know, not all the Castilla. So the first thing, not all the I mean, most I believe that most of the Spaniards who came here and colonized, you know, they, they didn't have even the awareness that colonization was something bad. Uh, you know, they they it's that you just came here, they were public servants, they live, you know, they had their life and they adapted or whatever. Some some of them rooted here forever. Some of them came back, no? But this idea that every single Spaniard came here to abuse and to take advantage of the natives, it's not, it, it doesn't respond to reality, though, to, to what really happened, right? So this is number one. And the, the same thing we can say about the friars. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm not a, you know, I'm not a believer, okay? So no one can tell me that I'm a Catholic proselytist or something like that. But I believe that, you know, a, pers a friar, who 19th century or even before, who came to the Philippines, 80% of them never came back to, the, to Spain. You know, mm -hmm. they really gave their lives to for something that they believe in. Of course, today will, our interpretation would be that would that, that should be like cultural um, annihilation or something like that. No, because you you don't respect the native beliefs, you want to replace with the, with the, with your own belief, right? You, you you want to actually actually most of the friars actually respected the native culture they don't respect the native beliefs you know like their own religion what so about the most, I mean, most... what about the literacy issue Jorge the idea that uh especially the friars were were um were not very keen on spreading Spanish literacy in the films I remember that's one point that one of the things that you pointed out vis-a-vis -vis something I wrote about Spain that you know by the end of the Spanish uh, colonialism, literacy rates were not in double digits. Were, they were in single digits, right? Way higher, of course, than neighboring countries. In fairness, we had the first modern university, etc. I get it. But it, it it's not like there was an effort at mass education in ways that it should be. That's why... It's, well, it's like very is, also, you know, yeah, please, can you also respond to that? At, yeah. yeah, I can give you an exact, an exact number. At the end of the Spanish period, there were 2,192 public schools in the Philippines. Hmm. Yes. So Almost that's not a, yeah. that's not small considering that at that time the population of the Philippines should be like eight or nine million people. Right. Right. And they had even schools in areas like you know, Cuyo Island, no? So in wow. uh, you know it's not that the thing is the thing is uh, and, and you know, of, of course the, the education at that time like in many many areas in Europe were in the hands of the friars. Yes. The problem the simply the simple for problem here is not so much that the friars didn't want to to teach Spanish is that the natives did not have incentives to learn it because they did not have the opportunity to practice it, to practice it. So, for example, if you live, I don't know, um, somewhere in Bataan, how many Spaniards were in Bataan? Mm. The alcalde and the friar. What's the point of learning Spanish to just to talk to two people? It's absurd, right? So the and, unless you were ambitious and you want. to no, it's a question of being practical. You know, what's the point of, of, of uh, investing time in something that is not useful? So who are the ones who, who learn Spanish? So they learn in Naga, Naga, uh, Batangas, uh, Manila, you know, Bigan, you know, big population of Spanish people, like at least 500 people. Then the people have incentives to talk and to learn, right? But, they, you know, the, 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 the Spanish population here even wasn't, I think, never was more than 15,000. So yeah. there was no incentives to learn. But I mean, I, I get your point, but the argument, counter argument would be, well, there were not also so many F Americans in the Philippines, and yet literacy rates were jumping pretty hugely uh, in the early 20th century in the Philippines, right? I mean, if you look at the numbers of universities open, mass education programs, teachers, it's not like Philippines were learning English because there were like millions of Americans, you know, gringos here in the Philippines, right? They were learning it because they had the opportunity to properly learn English. I mean, I get your point in the practical side, but but what about we are the... talking about mm -hmm. we were I was explaining that about the, the, the lack of a spread of Spanish language, not about literacy rates. Literacy rates, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but you know, I think most of I mean, uh, tra traditionally speaking, Filipinos always knew how to learn and how to read and write, right? Always when when the first friars came here, they described you know, all Filipinos know by buying, 
Ah, yeah, exactly. You know? Right, right. So if you if you are talking about reading and 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 writing, I think more most Filipinos knew, right? Mm. Uh, another thing is that they learn in the school or they learn from their parents. You know, it's educate the, the, the education does not come only from the school. Yes. But, yeah, but yeah, of course, and also a very important factor is like you know in in, in the, at the end of nineteenth century, the, Spain was a, was a, was an imperial power in complete decay. So even if they wanted to provide, they, they didn't they didn't have the means. I mean, exactly. Spain had was, was, was you know had a lot of areas in Spain at that time were so poor. You know, but really, really poor. Like you know, even people literally starving sometimes. So you know, it's not um, it's not I, I, you know, it's not it's not so much about bad intention because you know, even they have this idea, very nineteenth century idea, that the better power should civilize. You know, the indigenous. No, they have this idea, right? So the fact that they that they could not provide to the people is something that they was a bit even I would say shameful for them, right? So at the end, you know, uh. The Americans came and they have more, you know, they had they had a plan. Yeah, they, they really understand. had a plan and they executed very well, right? You're right. Okay. So I don't, I, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't blame the Americans for doing that. You know, they, you know, they, they defend their interest. You know, they, they, they trying to say that you know, they are the, they are modernity, they're the future. So you know, it's okay. They did what they have to do. Just like Chinese today, but anyway, huh? um. So this yes. is the okay. Let's let's end on this point because we're going to transition to I think the second part, which is I, I would say even more interesting. Thank you so much. I really appreciate these discussions. I mean, I, I like this back and forth because I see your nuancing argument, and I'm trying to give the other side of the argument so that people see that you know there it's a very variegated like there are fifty shades <laughs> of, of gray when it comes yes, to yes. colonial legacy, and yes, this is yes. what I like. We do it as two scholars, right? And I think that's what's lacking because in the public. Mainstream discussion tends to be either or. Americans good, Spanish bad, or some are pissed off at Americans. They say, no, Spanish, we're not that bad. Or some would say both were evil, blah, blah, blah. But what we're trying to do here is to sh show the 50 shades of it, right? So thank you very much for that. Now let's go to the second part and let's discuss the Illustrado part. Let me just read. Okay, amigo. Now let's go to really the interesting part as far as our, our exchange is concerned. Now, one of the things I like about your writings is that you acknowledge the contribution of Rizal. You you told us also about in, in a previous episode, you told us about you know how you were amused by the humor, if you read it in original Spanish, and then also the sophistication of the prose of Rizal. But I, what I really like about your intervention in this ongoing debates about the Ilustrados is that it's not just all about Rizal, right? And and and, and you know, some people who know about other Ilustrados are kind of they don't feel very comfortable with it. I mean. Honestly, let me put it this way. I mean, I have all respect for Rizal, all love for the guy. But objectively speaking, I would say Juan Luna is the most accomplished one, right? I mean, he won awards and, and I mean, that, you know, was among, I mean, he won the top award, right? In a major international exhibition. No offense. I'm not saying Rizal is not that good, but Rizal never had a comparable award to Juan Luna, right? In, in his own field. I mean, his novel is brilliant. Uh, again, I don't want to go down to the award point system, but but my point is, Objectively speaking, there were other illustrators who were way more accomplished or at least recognized during their time. And in fact, I you know, I just saw the Cleopatra the other day, and it's just incredible the imagination and depth that goes into it. If, if I'm sure some have seen the Battle of Lepanto or just the Scolarium. Oh my goodness, it's, it's, it's just so breathtaking. I mean, I love reading Rizal and all, including the latest translation of his books by Penguin Books. I think it's a pretty decent translation. But I mean, Juan Luna... Oh la la! I mean, it's just something else, right? I mean, and and I found it strange because all right, Filipinos were supposed to be visual people. I mean, let's be honest, Philippines is not a very reading country, right? <laughs> Compared to many no, other, no. and yet Juan Luna was the most visual, in your face, talented guy. I don't think he's getting as much, uh, you know, kudos and recognition or homage, right? As you as know, that, result, right? Yeah. This is a big problem with Juan Luna is that he killed his wife, so it's not a. It's not a you know from a more point canceled, of view. Too, so it's you, canceled. It's, no, it's not. It's not being canceled. You know, but it's, but it's really a big issue. No, it's really a big issue, especially today. No, where you know, um, I understand that you know he killed his wife out of jealousy and he killed also the mother-in-law. So it's yeah, but, not a you know. We have to accept, okay as an artist, you know, as an artist, of course, it's, of course, he was a very talented person, right? But I don't know, for example, if Juan Luna is so known today outside the Philippines. 
that, that I don't know. I don't think so. However, so, Jose Rizal yeah. is. Yeah. I see what I you're saying. I think that Jose Rizal is more known mm. today. It's strange, right? Yes. And I think it's also because, you know, because, you know, Juan Luna suddenly, you know, I won't say, okay, fine, maybe not canceled, but suddenly there's a big complication in the narrative. But let's not forget, Juan Luna also was the one who. I think was behind the uniform that the Filipino revolutionaries used. I mean, like this was a guy who was there through and through helping. And his brother, of course, General Luna, was there really leading the efforts against Americanos. And had he not been killed, I think he would have given the Americans a very tough Vietnam style kind of resistance. But but before going, I mean, okay, well, you but, know, yeah, yeah, but but my point is precisely because Juan Luna was kind of because of the tragedy and the crime that happened. I don't think there's enough effort to look at the art of the guy per se, because if you want to go down that road, I mean, Heidegger, it was a really a very problematic person, right? He helped Nazi Germany, Hitler, etc. But his works are respected on their own terms, right? Heidegger's philosophy is very, very... So I, I get the idea of the author versus the art, but I just don't think Juan Luna is getting anywhere close to the kind of recognition of the amazing art that he has. I mean, Spolarium is in your face, if you go there, right? In the museum yes. here. Okay, let's, let's, but you have to let's 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 look at history of art, no? I mean, Juan Luna belongs to history of art, and you have to compare Juan Luna with the art that was being made at that time in at the end of nineteenth century. From that point of view, Juan Luna's art is not innovative. It's actually it's more it's it's it's, it's, it's rather um, product of its era. Uh, I wouldn't say traditional, no, but like. It's more in the what it was in fashion at that, like, but it's like, not the innovative art, you know. He's not he's not Monet, for example, who was already, already painting at that time, no. Yeah. So he, the way he was painting was okay for the time, but he was not announcing the new trends, right? That were coming later. So from that point of view, it's more relevant for for history of Philippine art. But for history of world art, Juan Luna is not a, a really an expert. But if, if you have to put Juan Luna in the in the in, in the world context, no. But anyway, going to your point, there are many other people who are extremely talented, and then being they are being shadowed by 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 this um, over uh, exhibition of Jose Rizal, no. So, so speaking of which, I, 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 I wrote about, articles. Yeah, Pedro Paterno, exactly, who, who wrote a novel. I think two his novels was published two years before Rizal, right? Nina, if I'm not mistaken, came earlier. And you had an excellent article that we will post a link of, and I want really people to read. I really, really like that article of yours uh, on Pedro Paterno. And you were saying in many ways Pedro Paterno prefigured uh, the novel of Rizal. Uh, we'll also talk about a little bit of accusation of plagiarism about Rizal. I, I also like your take on that issue. And and also, I mean, for me personally, I think Pedro Paterno played a very important role because he was like he had the cultural capital and literally the capital, right, to yes. bring the greatest folks, minds, and artists in Madrid together and introduce the Filipino illustrados, you no, know, these upstart guys, to the best of the best in Madrid and Europe. I mean, he he did a lot. He did a lot of service to the illustrados, which I feel is not getting enough uh, attention and appreciation because, in the same way that Juan Luna has been kind of canceled for, you know, for, for the tragedy that happened. Pedro Paterno, of course, is because of the political accusations against him as a supposed turncoat and all. But anyways, can, can we go to your uh, to your take on Pedro Paterno, right? What is your take on, on Pedro Paterno's artistic and social political contribution to nine, late well, 1930s you know, and all, yeah? Pedro Paterno was a, a, a person of real um, encyclopedic knowledge, knowledge right? right? And... and, and, and real erudition and he was the first filipino who who was uh, you know who talked about the philippines in philippine right. terms you know not not in western terms but in right. philippine terms so sure. you know that, you know the, the problem with him as he has no precedent he was building a tradition innovative of, of philippine agree. knowledge spoken by filipinos everything starts by him Right, you like it or you dislike it. He's the first one who to to took the risk, right. and who took the risk, and he, he, he certain things right, as on certain things he committed mistakes and so on. But you cannot deny the the the, the right. fact that he was a pioneer. And you know, and regarding the specifically the novel Nina, I believe I can imagine that Jose Rizal read the novel and thought, and I think I can do it better, right? I, I can and I can do it something like you know with a <laughs> with more political content, right? Which, which is what he did, right? And you know, to be honest, Jose Rizal 
was a better writer, that the, 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 it's a better plot, and so on. But you have to acknowledge, you know, Nina for 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 what it is too. You know, it's, I think it's a it's a it's a typical Philippine, uh, it's a typical typical uh, romance, no, which is very very much in fashion nineteenth century. And you know the plot inspired knowledge. This uh, you know this is very uh, easy to identify. You you read about novels. The problem is that nobody read Nina, so nobody knew that. Right. But as you say, it's not only Paterno. We have Gregorio Santiago. Exactly. You know Gregorio Santiago. He wrote. He wrote. Yeah, yeah. He wrote a, a book titled uh, "The Progress of the Philippines." Right. Right. And, you know right. many of the problems of the Philippines. I believe the book is valid is it today. Right. Right. It's a, it's a very funny thing. Some of the problems that he's pointing out regarding administration, bureaucracy, right. how to create uh, to, to, to create a, a, an industry that is more, more productive, that you know you can apply today. And Marcelo del Pilar, Lope Jaena, Isabelo de los Reyes, which Isabel is incredible. Reyes, of it's course, incredible. on anthropology. Yeah, huge, yes. huge yeah. Yes. Uh, he was, you know, he was a very much uh was a socialist, no? Maybe and that guy Pardo de Tar of his leftist leanings. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just trying to make a guess here, right? That the fact that he was behind the labor movement, the socialist wave in the Philippines was not something that the Americans enjoyed. And probably it was in the interest of American colonial authorities to kind of de-emphasize. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, in fact, Rizal was moved by competition with Isabella de los Reyes. He saw really Isabella de los Reyes as a real direct competition in many ways. And and uh, Isabella <laughs> de los anthropological works forced Rizal to do his own, right? To try to come up with his own understanding of pre-Hispanic Philippines. So again, this is completely forgotten, right? Because I come from UP, right? I taught in Ateneo, but, but uh, everyone talks about Bonifacio versus Rizal. And for me, it's like, where is this coming from? Rizal's competition were Isabella de los Reyes. He was, you know, uh, coterminous with people like Paterno. Like, these are the people he has to be compared with. These are, uh, Bonifacio really comes later on as kind of a, you know, self-appointed protege, but I don't want to get into that. But, uh, well, we can get into that. But 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 that's my point. Like, I just feel that Paterno and others are not as appreciated, Juan Luna, et cetera, because it's all about just one person. We tend to do that always in the Philippines. Make it all about Corazon Aquino. Make it all about, you know what I'm saying? You can fill in the blanks. Make it all about uh, Rizal in this case. And I feel that's, that's not only unfair, uh, but that's also like misleading about the nature of a very complex and dynamic history that we had back then. But can you tell us also about what Paterno, for instance, was doing in terms of putting the uh, international Madrid elite in touch with the Illustrada elite, because remember he, I mean, he, he had a mansion there, right? Uh, he, he was a well endowed person and, and he used that to really create a new cultural scene. That was important, right? Because art and culture is also about interacting and meeting the right people, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, he, he helped many Filipinos, right? To, for example, I think uh, actually Juan Luna and, and Hidalgo, they, right. they got money from him. Right. right, because they were struggling to survive. To, yeah. to the crisis. So he was a generous person. No? I think he, he had um, a lot of eccentricities, like his personality, but he was a oh, generous oh, yeah. person. He, he, did, he disliked controversies, for example. No, so he, 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 he. he he, he collaborated with the Solidaridad, but he was not one of the main contributors, right? Sometimes he wrote certain things, but he right. was not looking for um, a fight with the Spaniards, right? He mm -hmm. was, he, 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 you know, he, the, the situation for him was rather com comfortable, no? Because right. he was so rich. He was so rich, so some, some, somehow the status quo was okay for him. The, so he was looking more or more less for more recognition, uh, maybe autonomy for the Philippines, Things like that, no. But the issue of blaming the Spaniards or insulting them or things like that it was not really his his thing, right? I mean, some some people has interpreted wrongly that he was a traitor, but I don't think see, I don't think so um, um, at all. Right? Why don't you think so? Can you elaborate more on that? Because you know, pa Pedro Paterno has become a byword for Turcontism no, uh, but... in politics. What do you think is the big, biggest problem with that kind of argumentation or caricature of Pedro Paterno? He was he was a peacemaker, right? Right. The fact of Bia Navarro, no, he was a peacemaker. So the, the the nationalistic historians do not forgive him for doing that. Right. You know, in today, we we find a peacemaker between Ukraine and Russia. He would be, you know, he would win another prize, right? But but you have a, a strictly nationalist reading of history, and you have a history according to which only the ones supporting the Katipunan are the right ones. 
you know, this is very, you are simplifying things. Things are more complex, right? right. So he was really trying to avoid a uh, bloodshed, you know, you know, he couldn't avoid a war. I think he did it with good purpose. I don't think he was anti-patriotic or anything. Right. Right. I mean, I, so, I, I think Joaquin mentioned my, 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 yeah. my own interpretation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Nick Joaquin, for instance, mentioned that, that you know, during the Battle of Manila, Pedro Paterno was trying to convince Aguinaldo to strike a deal with Madre España and create a common front against the gringos, right, who were closing in on the Philippines. I think they're, unlike Aguinaldo, Pedro Paterno probably knew what the Americans were up to, right? They were there to hijack the Philippine Revolution for their own colonial imperialist expansion. What is your take on that angle? Because it looks like it's interesting that Pedro Paterno is always accused of turncoatism, but it seems that he really wanted Spain as part of Philippines, you know, episteme in one way or another. If no longer as colonial master, then at, at least as kind of a special strategic partner, and in this case, against the Americans. So I see some sort of consistency there, right? I think he wanted to be also appointed as a duke. By, so he was really attached to Madre España, whether, uh, you know, in different permutations for that matter. Like, what is your knowledge of that? Or what do you think that was even feasible? Do you think that Spain would have uh, would have worked with the Indios against the Americans? Would have would that have been even feasible? That counterfactual? Do you think it's too crazy? What do you think about that? I, I'm just I'm just curious. Like, I know it's a very interesting think, counterfactual. But, but, uh, the thing is, you know, most most of of those uh, I'm gonna talk about, for example about the intellectuals, right? Most of those intellectuals, most of them, I think all of them, I would say, they didn't feel any hatred against the Spaniards at all, yeah. right? They just wanted their country to be independent, but yeah. they did not feel the Spaniards as such, right? It's, yeah. it's a, because most of them have Spanish friends, yes? Yeah. Most of them from the liberal side, right? But, you know, so they wanted to do it in the right way. They, they don't want also to, and to be honest, you know, as, as a Spaniard today, honestly, if, when I look at the history, I think you know Spaniards at that time lose a, a big chance. You know, you you, Interesting. you Spaniards should have no should have granted independence or or create a transition process, no, yeah. to to eventually grant independence. Let's say in twelve years, fifteen years, something like that. No, that's a, I, I, now it's very easy to say now in two thousand twenty three, right? But you know, I but believe Americans suddenly... did that. The Bahore, Americans did that. Americans gave a game plan that you'll go from Commonwealth to independence. I don't know how genuine that was, but there were negotiations over that, right? At least Americans kind of understood but that the, you have to negotiate something. No, like I, I think the, the, the Americans realized that keeping the territory this, it was a big trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> so It's like a way they, out. They were, they were looking for an off-ramp. Yeah, I, I, I think they were thinking about themselves. They were not, this is my opinion. Eh? All, all yeah, of course, you, this is just a discussion. Yeah, exactly. Evidence. I oh, believe yeah. that they were they were they were, they were solving a problem. You know, okay, let's give them independence, and then we keep we keep we keep cultural and economic influence. That's it. We don't need to control the territory. We can we can do something else. So it was an intelligent move too. And now you know, uh, Filipinos are always thankful to them. They, they forgot about what happened before. Yeah. So it was a very intelligent move. I mean, speaking of what happened before, we're talking about the Philippine American War, right, or the Philippine Revolution against. America, which by some accounts went into hundreds of thousands of casualties, and some would even say one million, which was what five percent of the population by that time. I mean, based on some accounts. And by the way, you can check this in American uh, sources that we can I can post later on. So this is not coming from you know China or from North Korea or Russia. These are American scholars acknowledging what a horrible effect their colonialism had in the Philippines. Because because remember, Mark Twain was against colonization of the Philippines. Yes. A very strong isolationist, anti-colonial movement also in America. So yes, on one hand, you had the more, let's say, you know, imperialists and riff and raffs in America who wanted expansion, but there were also a huge lobby against it. Did Spain have something similar to that? That there were people in Spain who had sufficient influence to say that, you know, we have to, you know, kind of a younger Omamono or something like that who would say maybe we have to have a more enlightened approach to Philippines, Cuba, or something like yes, that. Because I don't know about them. We don't we really have, know much about them. Did you have your own Mark Twain? We have. In, in, 18, in 1843, right. we, we had a, a, a public servant, Sinibaldo de Mas. Right. He wrote, a, a, he wrote a secret report in 18, 1843, already saying that. Oh. He said, listen, you know, we should, we should want for the Philippines the same thing that we want for ourselves. You know, 
if they want to be free, so let them let, let, let's give them freedom, right? And then we have also during in, in like Enrique in the time of of Rizal, we have uh, Enrique Moraita. He was right. a son. Right, right. So right. they were they were Spaniards supporting the the Philippine cause too, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. So that's true. So they had their own, Spain also had its own Mark Twain's in that sense. And obviously, I mean, yeah, I mean, to be honest, as a Filipino, like I'm going there, I'm looking at your the Goya paintings of you know your independence struggle against France and you know Dos Mayo and all, and like that's kind of weird. Right? Like you want to be independent for France, but you were still colonizing us, you know? I mean, for me, it's like, hmm, it's a little bit too much hypocrisy for me. Uh, you know, like, anyway, I just found that very strange uh, as a Filipino, by the way. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Richard, Richard, I want to, I want to clarify something that is very important. That is not very, uh, Please, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. today, right? I mean, you know, the, 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 the Filipinos that wanted independence, they were not against the idea of colonization as such. Mm. Okay, I mean, they understood that Filipinos are civilized enough right. to get self government. So it's, it's a very different the issue. They understood that there are some some people that are more superior, and they are let's say legitimated to, to control or or dominate other they, territories. They, they say the that you, they internalize the imperialist logic. Is that what? No, they they just understood that that at that at that time they just simply acknowledged there are cultures that are better than others. That's it, as simple as that. So and they understood that Filipino culture is already civilized and advanced, and they don't need Spain for anything. That's it. So for for example, when they Teodoro Calau, no Teodoro Calau, right. no the, the intellectual, no when he traveled to Hong Kong, he said those those Chinese, you know, they are hopeless. No, it's better the British to control them because you know. I don't think they can do anything alone, right? And then he traveled to, to he, he traveled to certain territory, he, he traveled to Sri Lanka, right? And he thinks the same, you know, ah, those those people, you know, better to be in control of the, of the British, you know, because alone they are not civilized enough. So th this is idea. It was very, very normal at the oh, 19th man. century, at the beginning of the... Mm -hmm. it's, not that, it's not that they are anti-colonization in general. Mm -hmm. They are not, no. You know, they have, they have they had categories at that time. It's very it's a very uncomfortable truth. Like for example, even Antonio Luna, he wrote this book called Impresiones. No, yes, has been yes. translated to Tagalog recently. So he when he in this book he's like making making fun of the Spaniards, he's laughing at the Spaniards, he's talking about things about the Spaniards, right? But when he's talking about this uh, universal exhibition, he makes clear that hey, I'm not those, I'm not I'm not that savage from Cordillera. I'm an illustrado from Manila, right? So even himself, you know, he he feels bad because of Filipino. Is they are they are being exposed, but at the same time, he's categorizing himself as something superior because he's a Westernized illustrado Filipino. He's not an indigenous one, right? So, yeah. So those you know those ideas. You, you, sometimes we are uh, like projecting our own ideology right. on people from the past who did not think that way. Right, so it's very uncomfortable, but it's very common to read racist comments among the illustrators too, because what's the common way of thinking at that time? Sadly, right? Yeah, and especially against the Chinese, Chinese, I have to say. Towards also the racism towards our Muslim brothers and sisters back then, right? Which continues up until today, right? I mean, that I think that was a very clear case. We can see a lot of very negative things said about. I mean, I think even with Rizal, there was a lot of debate about how did Rizal see the future of Muslim parts of Mindanao, which was majority Muslim back then, you know, in an independent Philippines. And some even said a counterfactual had uh, had Antonio Luna been victorious, he probably would have been just the king of Luzon, right? Ilocanos and Tagalogs and all. And there are question also about how open that would have been to Visayan or you know other parts of the Philippines. So I completely see where you're where you're coming from. But isn't that the argument of the let's call them the the Bonifacio wing, which is, but Bonifacio was really genuinely revolutionary because he wanted a complete break from the whole Madre España and the game of Imperium, and that makes him the real hero because supposed Rizal and others were in many ways still tethered to Madre España and therefore not real revolutionaries. I mean, what do you think about that argument? I mean, the whole Agoncillo school of thought, right? And it's babies. I think I think you know that that arguments come from. From this obsession in the Philippines in with heroes, no? right. <laughs> like, you know, right. like, you know the Rizal or Bonifacio, Bonifacio or Agoncillo, you know, they are completely different. They are completely different. So, uh, 
So it's like to give. It's like is this this at the end of the what is under what 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 is underlined there is the idea that there should be a, like a leader, right? Like right. a leader to 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 hold to admire, no, to to praise something like that, no. It's, it's difficult to choose because at the end we are just hypothesizing about what could happen right. or not, no. But so, that's our job, right? Isn't that the job? <laughs> historians and thinkers, you know, go back to history, uh, attach meaning to it and all, without, of course, yeah, being all over the place uh, and, and inventing stuff. Well, you know, I understand that one, one, of, one, of, the, one of the roles of history is that to, to create a, a sense of belonging in a yeah. certain community, in, in a certain political community. Huh? The, in, in this case, the political entity is the Philippines and the Filipino people, right? So right. you have to create a, a common narrative for everyone, no? The problems, the problem is when your nationalistic uh, 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 tone goes too far, right? So you make cherry picking, no? Or you emphasize things and then you hide certain things, which is very normal, right? Very normal. But the things sometimes you go too far, and and you know you over over exaggerate the role of certain yeah. things and you shut. Yes, yes. You this is your something own. that. You impose your own prejudices and biases on the author. I mean, we, in a way, it's it's, uh, it's. I want to what's the adulterating. I want to use another term, but I'm not sure it's polite. Like adulterating, yeah, the essence of the work or the circumstances of that person, uh, so on and so forth. And again, let's be very clear. This is late 19th century. We're talking about not early 20th century. Not, but but so I mean, how do you compare the illustrados to say Simon Bolivar? Or comparable figures in Latin America who push for independence yeah, I, from Madre España, the Creoles in Latin America. How, how do you compare them, for instance? I, I would not compare, for example, Jose Rizal to Bolivar. I would compare him to Jose Martí. Ah, of Cuba. I, yeah, yeah. Mm, yes, or, yes. Or, or, I, but I, the, the, the thing Philippines is. Did you have a Simon Bolivar? Was it Aguinaldo? I mean, who's the Simon Bolivar of Philippines? Do you even have someone like him? Would it be Aguinaldo? Would it be, you know, I mean, Aguinaldo, I mean, Aguinaldo would be. Comes close. Yeah, Codilio, etc. The, the, yeah. the, 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 truth, the truth is that Aguinaldo, at the end of the day, was, was not such a good strategist as Bolivar, no? Because, you know, to call, call for help from the Americans was a very stupid idea. You know, no, 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 no country in the world is going to send you their soldiers. That, 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 that they can die. You know, the, the soldier has families too, right? So they're they not going to sacrifice soldiers just to grant you independence. That's a very stupid idea. Right. Really, really, <laughs> so, it was very naive. It was very. Well, very but it happened many times. It happened many times in history. Like you know, when Napoleon invaded Spain, you know how he invaded Spain. Right, right. You know, he he is like you know he he called Napoleon called our, our king, and said, listen, we want to we want to attack Portugal. Can we pass through your territory? Right. And the king but said, yes, of course, yeah, yeah. Probably you pass. Yeah. And, and then he, he took leave. Spain, right? Yeah, just like yeah, that. Exactly. Just also, like... It's a very stupid thing. It happened many times in history, the same thing, right? You take advantage of the confidence of the other person. <laughs> that was, yeah. So, that, yes, I can... that was, that was, yeah. Napoleon really, he got that very too easy. The Spanish conquest was just like, what? Like they just let them in with no whatever, right? That was, that was really crazy. Yeah, yeah, this... was... <laughs> Speaking this of Illinois, the most stupid king you have. So speaking of Illustrado, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was also reading about your other king, uh, you know, anyway. Um, going back to this, um, just to wrap up the discussion, Illustrados, like who are like your favorite illustrators that you think did not get enough credit or should get a second look now? Um, maybe we have already hinted at that, but 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 aside from Rizal, right? Who do you think, or what do you think is the right approach to understanding the Illustrados of Philippines? What is the right framework and ethical um uh, you know, predisposition. Well, the, you know, the, the person that I believe is, is is more interesting for me uh, is uh, uh, Isabella de los Reyes. De los Reyes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. As, 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 you, as you know, I'm, I'm I'm not a leftist, but you know, the things must be acknowledged. You know, he have a intellectual capacity that was incredible, and he was very hardworking, determined. He launched so many newspapers. Right, he wanted to educate. He he launched the Ilocano, the, the the first Filipino newspapers owned by a Filipino. He even bought the printing press to print it himself. Right, so he was really a person who who had, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 
a determination, no, a, a big, a big impetus, no, to to work for the Philippines, no, and he had I, his own ideas, you know, you know, you can disagree or dis or agree with his ideas, but he was an intellectual uh, uh, person to to admire. For me, there is not doubt, and it's not, it's not, my opinion is not, it does not, it has not get enough credit. And then the second question is, I believe that all that group of intellectuals should be understood as a whole. Yes, as right. A if you focus you focus in Rizal only you don't understand really what happened you know it's a, it was a community of ex scholars intellectuals thinkers no probably the most brilliant generation actually that the Philippines produced right and you know it's easy to it's easy and, and they didn't agree eh? they have different levels of uh, of, of different solutions That's for the problems of the country no but if they agreed in the idea of self government as a as a as a middle term or long term uh, goal, right? But you know, it's, a, it's an incredible, brilliant, brilliant generation, and I believe that should be. For example, I like the approach of Resil Mojares. No, right, right. His book, uh, Brains of the Nation. Brains, Brains of the Nation. Yes, yeah. it's an incredible. It's a very good. It's a very good book. Huh? Right. Where, where actually Pedro Paterno gets much more recognition for his intellectual contributions than anywhere yes. else, comparable. Yes, influence you know in fairness to him yeah i really like what how the resil approach i think resil really helped me a lot to appreciate the ecosystem of in fact if you look at the illustrados and all they owe it a lot to early 19th century right uh creole filipinos right who were also inspired by cadiz constitution by the liberal uh republican ideals that came from france so, so for all the bashing of napoleon at least france brought a much more modern Republican ideals to Spain and its colonies, including the Philippines, right? And not to mention, we had much more progressive American, uh, sorry, Spanish general, uh, you know, Spanish governor generals in the Philippines that we are also not talking about because we always think about just, uh, you know, the, the the most brutal ones, right? But but we we tend to forget also uh, that part. Now I don't want to exhaust this because I hope to get back to you in the future and hopefully in person we can do a proper one in the studio and all, so yes, people can see us with our hand gestures and all. I know that you're fluent also in Italian. Maybe you can have it more like Italiano hand gestures and all, and and, and have that discussion. So, really also, also in Polish, in Polish you can you can discuss about Poland. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, that, I was very surprised, but okay, we can talk about Warsaw and uh, we can go all the way back to the Peter the Great era, no? And then the very interesting interactions they had with Poland. Th that's an interesting. So I don't want to exhaust that because I want to talk about a lot of things. So thank you very much for this discussion in the strata. So on next episode, let's talk about the 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 way forward for Philippines and Spain. Thank you. <laughs> you got it. Okay. No okay. So let's do one more episode. Um. Uh. Now, just on the last part, I want to get your point of view on the ways forward. I mean, um, from Spain's own um, own history, what do you think are the lessons for the... Of course, we're very different countries, but we also have many similarities. And, and, and for me, among all, quote-unquote, Western countries, I think Spain has is one of the more promising, interesting cases where the Philippines can get some good. I mean, if if we're going to learn something from Western countries, so quote-unquote Western countries, I'd rather have it Spain than, than the U.S. because, I mean, Spain had very difficult century, right? I mean, after the collapse of, uh, more or less collapse of the Spanish Empire in Latin America with, with loss of Cuba and then also in, in Asia with the loss of East Indies, Spanish Indies in this Philippines per se, you were more or less just left with right with North Africa, and then the, there was the annual war, horrible. So by the interwar period, <laughs> essentially you you were you're as a nation you collapsed right so much so that you were forced to essentially uh, get a dictator to put things together, and this dictator actually happens to be the uh, related to the last governor general of the of the Philippines, right? So can you tell us a little bit about that because it's. So the loss of the Philippines, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and later on, of course, parts of North Africa, uh, Africa in Morocco especially, that was a very traumatic experience for Spain, right? I mean, uh, and it created a very bloody, tumultuous, and dynamic period in Spanish history. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I'm not sure many people appreciate that part of Sp Spain's history too. Well, you know, um, I think after the, the the big loss in 1898, you know, because we lost uh, Philippines and also Cuba and Puerto Rico, you know, um, Spain tried to to uh, let's say keep some kind of imperial pulse, and that and that was in um, in Africa. No, we had certain territories in Morocco today, uh, Western Sahara, and then also uh, Equatorial Guinea. Right? right. So 
but um, uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, and we were losing everything slowly. Actually, I think it, Equatorial Guinea, the, the independence was granted. Yes, it was right. granted. Um, but in the middle, you know, we had a, a dictatorship by Primo de Rivera, yes, in the 20s. And actually, at the beginning, that dictatorship was not bad. From an economic point of view, Spain uh, uh, was doing well. Uh, but only the last two years, he started to, 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 to you know, that the things were not doing well. So he resigned. Right? He resigned. Of course, Great Depression. Then we have, yeah. Yeah. He resigned, then the king went to exile, and Spain became a republic. Yes, only for eight, six or seven years. Right. The Republic was a very tumultuous period. You know, sometimes it's been romanticized, like, like the best period of the history. But to be honest, uh, you know, uh, when you start reading about what happened, you know, was, there was yeah. many several governments, a lot of elections, change of government, elections, you know, it was not a, a such a, it was a, you know, let's say it was a hopeful period, but it never concreted in something really, you know, yeah. that was a, it was something like prom promising. But to be honest, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't achieve anything. And then it ended with polarization of the society. You know, there was a very strong polarization of society that ended in the civil war. No, so the, the nationals against the, the republicans, uh, radicals, yeah. And Franco and Franco won, right? Franco won, and we had a long dictatorship. Spain was a very country. You know, we, when I talk to my parents, they tell me about the you know how poor it was. Was incredibly poor. You know, like exactly. My, my father, my father, my father told me, for example, he had to go to to steal eggs, right? You know, he go to the go to a farm to steal eggs, and he eat them raw, raw, right? right? right. And I said, and I asked my father, why did you eat it raw? He said, no, because you cannot run. Because if you run, the yeah. eggs become broken. Yeah. So you so have to I eat. put it inside. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. He was he was so he was so hungry to that level, right? So this is when actually 19th, during that period. When is this? Nineteen fifties. What what exact decade? 19, are we 19, 1950s. 1950s, right? So 1950s. this is this is the decade after the civil war and World War II when Spain was very isolated, right? Because it was kind of allied yes. with the Axis powers, but also it, it didn't want to ally with the West in the Cold War, try to be neutral. So you were kind of like a you know a desert of isolation there with no friendly counterparts, right? And yes. yeah. Yes, Spain was neutral in the First World War, and Spain was neutral in the Second World War. I mean, I mean, Hitler actually called called. You know, they had a very famous meeting with Franco. Franco right. did not want to support um, Hitler with army yeah. or weapons or anything. You know, it's like you know, Spain had too many problems inside her. You know, they could not yeah. afford to support any, yeah. anyone, right? And he also reduced for a while the number of the uh, you know the mobilization, right? I think at some point in civil war there was one million troops. He brought it down to just around 200,000. So you really don't want to get involved in any major conflict, right? Very, very uh, neutral uh, in, the, in, 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 in a very stubborn way. But, but what, what was he, he? Is he a fascist? I mean, how do you characterize Franco? Or how is he understood today? Because some would say he was, well, he was straightforward fascist. He I mean, was, America, he was, whatever happened, there was... was yeah. the, the, first, the, first, the first years of... He was more fascist actually during the first years, right? Mm -hmm. But then slightly he became more, let's say, uh, you know, there, there he, he appointed ministers that were te technocrats, right? So, you know, despite the fact I don't like Franco at all, you know, much of the development of of, of Spain came thanks to him. Like, you know, he pro he he made he built uh, he's famous for having built so many dams, so right. everybody had access to water. He, he the electricity you know got everywhere right the economy was improving also he built so many hospitals our 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 social security system right it's as, as we have it to with, with with free access to 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 to, to hospital that is a is a thing of franco even the pension system for elders no when they retire the the subsidies when you are unemployed so you know it's, it's typical from the extreme right to do so, those socialist policies too. If you pay attention to, you know, it's a very this this thing of taking care of the people, right? Very yeah. a very paternal, paternalistic approach to government. Right. But the the ministers were, you know, the, the thing is there was no 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 freedom of expression. Right. There were no political party, right? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You know, so you know, it's a it's very and he killed a lot of a lot a lot of you know uh, let's say. 
uh, how do you call that? Uh, you know, all, all all the leftists basically had to go to exile because he will he will especially in the forties in the fifties he will kill them all. So it's, they were exiled you know, to Mexico, very... right? They were exiled to Mexico. Like what was going on there? Why was yeah. Mexico hosting the exiled government of 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 Spain, like the socialists and all of those people? What was going on there? Well, that that that, yeah. that, that was a very 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 wise movement from the part of, of Mexico. You know, the, the the intellectual elite of Spain were leaving, so Mexico said, "Just come here, come uh, come here and work in our university." Interesting. They, most of them work in the university, newspapers, you know, teachers, uh, people it's like that. Brain drain, kind of a brain drain that uh, that benefited. Uh, yes, exactly. Mexico, exactly. Right? Yeah, doesn't. I was wondering, mm -hmm. well, was there some big problem between Mexico and Spain that they would do something like that, even host a so-called exiled government, which would not be abolished until years after Franco's death? But I mean, speaking of Franco, this is interesting. I mean, I know you're referring to the Spanish economic miracle, especially from mid 1950s to early 1970s, right? This is the last. 15 years of Franco's life and rule. I mean, but of course, in the Philippines, we kind of had our own version of Franco, or maybe not, right? Because Franco, at least in the Spanish economic miracle, you had sustained economic growth of, I think, more than 6% for almost a decade, right? And which is not something that we ever saw in the Philippines, right? It was closer to what happened in Japan, in Taiwan, in South Korea. So I think the term that some use for, let's say, Franco the older, right? Franco the younger, much closer to a fascist leader, but Franco the older was, he was more like a developmental dictator or developmental autocrat, right? Which is, again, a very yes. similar to what we yes. saw in Taiwan, Korea, Japan, which is not as much appreciated. So he was a very dynamic person in that sense, so that he shifted power from the more phalangist or conservative ones to the more technocratic class who oversaw that. Like, what what are the parallels with Marcos, or what what do you think about those who try to make a parallel? Or because Marcos had an interesting relationship with Franco too, right? He got the Spolarium from Franco. There was some sort of a fraternal affection. What was going on there? Can you tell us about that? Connecting to Philippines, Franco, Marcos, compare well, contrast, you know, etc. Yeah. But you know, there, there is a the, the thing with, with Franco and, and Marcos is that you know Franco has you know he, he was a military man, no? Right. And right. and. My my opinion, my personal opinion, he had some kind of uh, let's say imperial nostalgia, right? right? So he thought, you know, that, you know, making friendship with Marcos would be a way to reestablish some kind of cultural or economic influence over the Philippines, something like that. No, I, I believe I I don't think that you know currently in democracy Spain I don't think that we have any any kind of colonial policy now, right? Not at all. But I think uh, probably Franco had that that you know. That nostalgia, right? Because he's a. By the way, Franco was not a very intelligent person, huh? but he was he was wise enough to to appoint people who are uh, good at, at the, you him. know like he appointed good ministers. Yeah, he was yes. smart yes. enough to know he was not that smart, so he put the smarter people. He knew there. his limitations. He knew his limitations, which right? Is a way of intelligence, right? Which is a way of intelligence in itself, right? Now, Spain, yes. of mm. course, had its own transition to democracy not too far away from the Philippines, right? So we're talking about the 80s, right? Of course, Franco dies by the mid-1970s, and then a number of people come. Suarez comes. He tries to put different groups together. I was reading about the transition period. There's this fascinating book, Splintering of Spain. You, you can see how difficult the transition period for Spain was, considering all the background story that we kind of just touched upon. Um, can you tell us about the uh, Spanish transition to democracy? And again, what are the similarities and differences with the Philippine experience of transition democracy in the 1980s? Because right. yours was peaceful too, right? Uh, Except that storming of the parliament and the king had to intervene and all of that, yeah? You know, the, 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 the Spanish uh, transition was, yeah. was, um, was almost a miracle, right? Because, uh, you know, uh, people were tired of... of, of, of uh, uh, the dictatorship. Everybody wanted democracy, and everybody realized that he didn't want to make a um, a, 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 a livable country, right, with freedoms and so. Everyone has to sit something, to sit, to 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 reject something. You know, you you cannot you cannot demand everything that you want. So all political factions reunited, right, uh, and you know, and they were able to 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 draw a constitution. Right. That that ninety something percent of people accepted and voted in Spain, right? So I mean, the, Franco when he died, he gave, he gave, he gave the power to the king. Right. The king didn't want to have power. He wanted to keep uh, just like a symbolic role, like, sure. like in other monarchies in in, in Europe. 
it's more a symbolic role. It's, they are not really, they are kings, but they don't act as kings anymore, you know? Right. So so he gave the, the power to the people, right? And and the people decided to to have a, a, a parliamentary system, a democracy, elections, uh, you know, with all the good things and the bad things that democracy can bring to the country, right? And in the case of Marcos was was a bloody thing, you know. I, I don't think I don't think that without the intervention of the people, without the mobilization of the people, without the anger of the people, right. I don't think Marcos would have signed voluntarily. Yeah. Uh, it, right. it, it was it was completely uh, not in his mind, right? He was forced to, right? So in that case, so the, from that point of view, yeah. yeah. Yeah, please. So in that, I think that they, they, yeah, Spain is more like Chile, a post Pinochet. I mean, kind of a pacted transition, yeah. right? Or kind of negotiated transition. That's what happened. Unlike in the Philippines, it was really people power, kind of more like Berlin situation, right? People just come out and gave up on the system, and the whole thing just a decaying dictatorship just collapsed. More, more heroic, more heroic here, right? <laughs> right, and and. Yeah. Obviously, Spain has a lot of problems still. I mean, we know the situation with Catalonia. I mean, I remember when I was in Brussels in 2016-17, I would see all these protests with flag of Catalonia. Uh, num uh, Catalonian leaders had to be exiled. I mean, and then there were like some violent protests in, in Madrid. I, I've been following what has ha been happening in Spain. But it seems that Spain has still come a long way, right? I mean, you had terrorism with ETA, with Basque ETA, and then you had, you know, very ETA, and then you had this, you know, Catalonia. But overall, like... Do you see Spain as a success story today? I mean, compared to what it was during your dad's generation and your younger years. And is there any lesson do you think that Spain has for some of, let's say, Commonwealth country, if we can use that term, right? Countries with some similar background in history. Well, well my, my opinion is that you come from the Philippines right. and you land in, in Spain, you know, the, the impression that you get is like, like it's a very prosperous country and you, there are many opportunities. But this is not my opinion right now. I mean, I believe that since 2005, 2006, Spain is failing in many issues. You know, right. the, the quality of the democracy is going down. There is institutional uh, erosion. Uh, there, is not, there is not, for example, there is no real separation of powers, right? I mean, the, 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 the same things that... that yeah. yeah, I, I mean, you know, where do you see and Poland... Yeah. Uh, Hungary and Poland have been accused of, for example, you know, they appoint judges that are that belong to the political party. Right, exactly. So our Pedro Sanchez, Pedro Sanchez is doing the same. Mm -hmm. He's not being criticized so much because he's With he's into the progressive line of the European Union, but he's doing exactly the same. He's sabotaging democracy, right, and 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 separation of powers. And also from two thousand six. The, the 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 purchase capacity of, of Spaniards has, 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 has been reduced. I mean, we are, now there are countries like Czech Republic or That's Lithuania. The, 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 the GDP per capita in those countries is better. So those countries have been improving a lot and we have been stagnant like Japan, right? You had a debt crisis. So right? it's a country. Yeah, you had a bad debt crisis in 2008, no? The pigs crisis, Portugal. Ireland, uh, Greece, and of course Spain, right? I mean, how do you do, are you saying Spain hasn't recovered from that from the from the sovereign debt crisis of late two thousands? No, our, our our public debt is 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 absurd. I think it's now one hundred thirty percent. So you know we are living in, some, in a we are living in a fiction. You know, yeah. if one day if one day we fail to pay what we what we owe, we will fail like Greece, hmm. right? And and sometimes we are not. Um, I mean, we are trying to 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 live above our our means, right. right? There are there is there is too much public expenses. You know, most of the employment that is being generated is public employment, right? right? Actually, private employment is being destroyed all the time. So at the end, you know, you need you need private enterprises, right? We, and with those taxes, you generate. Uh, the public expenses and even the public jobs, right? But the problem is that it's too much. We have too much pension people. We have an aged population, and too much money go to the pensions. The pensions in Spain are, I think, is the one of the, the I think are the best in Europe or the second best country in, the, in Europe, right? So it's sometimes there are many things that you cannot change because if you if you are if you exactly. are yeah. you decide to, to you 
if you decide to reduce the pensions for the elderly, you will lose the elections because they are like 30% of the population already. Maybe you need so them. My, my, Do you think you need someone like Macron to kind of shake up the system? Because I'm, I'm rather I'm rather pessimistic. Mm, mm. I mean, the only thing I noticed with with Spain is I'm also rather, I'm, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I, I mean, the only thing yes, I noticed is yes. you don't also have much of a manufacturing sector, right? I mean, at least you go to Italy, you'll see a lot of Fiat, you know, local cars, mass cars. You go to Spain, I'm seeing a lot of French cars or Volkswagen certified cars that are kind of made in Spain, right? Because I know in the 60s, 70s, you had your massive car industry, right? You had very huge manufacturing sector. And I'm not hearing as much about Spanish manufacturing sector, what's going on. And and you don't also have these global brands like Italy, right? I was just talking to some Spanish diplomats. I said, you see, Italy doesn't have much really presence in many ways or history in Asia, but we know them because of their brands, right? And their culture in Spain. And, even Zara, people think, don't know think, Zara think, is actually Spanish. Yeah. Yes, the Italians are very good about advertising right. themselves, right? I yeah, have right, to, right, exactly. They are very good. No promotion. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then, 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 you know, to be honest, Alfa Romeo car are not as good as they say. But no, no, they it's are, not, you know, I'm not, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no, the they are not, you know, what uh, get. Yes, but, you know, what Spain does, mostly, for, I think we, we are strong in, in infrastructure companies. I mean, exactly, Spanish yeah. companies are building highways. They are building highways in bridges in the in the US, in UK. Uh, they build airports, they build subways. The Panama Channel well, was built by a Spanish company. So, you know, trains. Uh, that that's probably the engineering thing is the is the thing that uh, that generates a lot of income, right? Really. It's the and Spain is really strong in that. Of course, of course, the fashion industry too. Uh, and then, you know, you know, tourism, you know, I think Spain is the number two in the world. So Yes, this is how we are trying to to to, cope. to make money and survive. Enough, eh? Right. Yeah. But you, yeah, as I was saying, like in terms of branding, in terms of car manufacturing, or even the startup industry. No, it, the, Spain is not probably where it should be. No, although I probably no. in Barcelona things are a little bit more dynamic. I don't know. You tell me. No, the 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 place where things are becoming really for startups good is Malaga. Malaga. Ah, uh, so down a little bit, close yes. to Gibraltar. Yeah. Yes. All yeah. A lot of Silicon Valley companies are going to Malaga right now. Why? Because the taxes yes. are low? It's next to what? What's they going get, on? Get, well, you know, they have uh, nice beaches, good weather, <laughs> good sure. food. It's, not, it's, 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 way cheaper. it's way cheaper than Barcelona, right? right. And right. and the tax is pro probably the regulation is very favorable to, to that. So, I mean, the problem is also in Spain that, you know, many companies went, go, go to Portugal. They have uh, better regulations and better taxes for that, right? Right. So, and the exception in, in Spain probably is is Malaga. Interesting. That's very interesting. And lastly, where do you see Philippines and Spain going? I mean, do you see your king visiting the Philippines? I think last time your king visited the Philippines, or a king visit was nineteen ninety nine or something like that. Like last time a Filipino president visited, I think it was Arroyo time. So it's like. We're not really paying much attention to each other, right? I mean, of course, I just came from Tribuna. I see the effort in Fernes Kudus to Casa Asia, to friends in uh, Institut Cervantes. I mean, I see the effort, but it, it looks like it, it's really low base still, no? Like we have to push it up. Although I know a lot of China, uh, infrastructure companies in Spain are interested to come in because the Philippines is beginning to pick it up, right? I mean, can you tell us about that? More like contemporary and the future, yeah. So, you know, I believe that, you know, there are more um, Philippine investments in, in, in Spain and there are more Spanish investments in, in the Philippines. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Spain, for Spain, for example, in, in, in um, how do you call it, international cooperation, Philippines right. is the number one in Asia. The biggest budget for cooperation to help poor communities and so on. Right. So on. This is uh, Philippines right. the number one uh, by far, right? But the problem is that there is a common ignorance. I told you, you know, that the, I mean, yeah. the politicians in the politicians in Spain are not aware of the opportunities of Asia. And you know, and if Spain wants to enter in Asia, my 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 strong belief is that Manila I mean, should be the entrance. You know, like also Philippines is, like is geographically placed. 
Yes, Ge geographically placed in the, be in the in the best area. No, yesterday I was talking to a, a Korean investor who he opened right. a, a branch of this company here, and asked him, I say, why you choose Manila? Why you don't go to Singapore or Taiwan or Kuala Lumpur? Thailand, yeah. They say, no, 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 Manila is the best. They they speak English, they speak English, and it's geographically placed right in the center. Is everything is like less than three hours flying. So he wanted to expand his company starting from Manila. I, be, I believe the same thing. You know, if any Spanish company wants to invest in Vietnam or Indonesia, they should start from the Philippines. I think it should be the 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 number one place, no? And you know, we have also Andrew Tan has a lot of a lot of investments in, in Spain, you know, sharing bodegas, they have uh they have a lot of real estate, you know. So, you know, I think we should have more, you know free markets and, uh, you know, relationship to, to improve, you know, to improve our relations, facilitate uh, the, and the, the movement of people to, you know, I, I believe that, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, to be honest, I like to see Filipino, you know, it's very strange. I, don't, I like to see, every time I see Filipino people in Madrid, I'm very happy. I talk to them. I go yeah, to yeah, them yeah, and I say, I, 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 yeah. I know. It's a... You know, I feel, I feel, I, I, strong, I, I feel effect. strong. Yes, with Filipino people, to be honest. So, you know, and they and they are, you know, to be honest, they, they don't create problems. It's yeah. a community that they're they there to work, they adapt, they, yeah. you know, they don't create, they, they don't go into criminal issues. No, they are, so it's, you know, it's a, in that sense, they are very modelic. I, I, not, and I don't get disturbed at all. By one, it's just the opposite. I, I, I become very happy. Right. And on the last point, let's, think, let's talk about linguae, right? Because language is a very important way of bonding, if building cultural bridges. I mean, UK and US have a special relationship so much so far. I mean, one of the things that prevents us from having a similar or hopefully better kind of a special relationship is the language barrier, right? I mean, Spain is not as bilingual as perhaps it should be. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I get... Uh, I mean, I like the fact that in Spain I can get away with Spanglish or uh, in ways that I cannot get away with <laughs> French English, right? In Paris, I love it, right? Like if I cannot speak, it, I'll just say it in English, and the rest I'll say Spanish, and they're super nice. I love it. I felt so home there, right? Um, but but how do you think we can ho help them? Because um, amigo, let me be honest about it. Because my sense is maybe we have to do more surveys, and my sense is one problem we have with Spanish in the Philippines is that. Of course, you know more than me about this, but it's like it's too too it's too poshified, right? Because if you go to the richest Filipinos, they don't English, they don't speak English among themselves. They speak Spanish among themselves, and with some <laughs> affectation, right? <laughs> kind of like Castilian, <laughs> arrogante, like it's 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 que horror, right? I mean, like you're 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 making Spanish language uh, unrelatable and alienating when in fact spanish is one of the sweetest and easiest to you know i mean it's funny i know many filipinos suddenly want to speak uh spanish because they watch narcos you know like or like they see the colombian version or like the mexicano version and 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 that's the thing like if you say castilia it, it has this kind of a going back to our conversation like this kind of arrogant colonialism but when you say but you, when you say mexican english or peruvian suddenly it, it sounds more, so i think psychology is also important here because the language, the Spanish language, has a certain reputation that is alienating. It's it's like French kind of to a lot of people, kind of intimidating imperial language. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but this is my observation from my own experiences of dealing with Filipinos, dealing with friends around the world, and and uh, because when you go to Spain and talk to the Spaniel, it's so you know it's so sweet and friendly, and you know what I'm saying. It's I'm not saying this because I'm talking to a Spaniard. I'm really saying this on on the record over and over again. <laughs> I don't get this with other non-English uh, major countries in Europe, to be honest. You know, I mean, Germans have their own thing and the French and all. But I, 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 do you see what I'm saying here? I mean, do you see where I'm coming from here? And, and how, how do we make Spanish more relatable, less alienating, considering it's relatively easy for Filipinos to learn it compared to, I don't know, Arabic or Mandarin, right? I would say, or definitely French, which is a lot about accents rather than really vocabulary and all. You tell me, amigo. To be, to be honest, I, I don't think that the, the, the Filipinos um, uh, connect Spanish to something posh or to be mm. something like pretentious or no. I mean, you know, mo I mean, most of the people who who learn Spanish right now in Cervantes, they do it for practical reasons. Yes, and they they work in centers or they work international organizations or they want to immigrate to the U.S. It's yeah. very funny. They want to learn Spanish 
to have more chances to find jobs in the US, right? So how is that gonna work? Like, what do you mean? I, like, mean, I don't think they it? really. I, I don't get that. I go to the US because if they want, if, if they yes, because you go to Florida or to California, you know, and work with the. the, 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 the you, 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 you need to speak Spanish. No one will hire you because you, you cannot sell things. Yeah, right, right. You need to be bilingual. Sure, sure. You need to be bilingual. And they know. They have, they have been in California and they, you know, you go to California and you talk to the waiter and to the driver. Or, yeah, they are all Spanish speaking. Yeah, you know, yeah. I didn't speak. When I was in California, I only learned, I only talk English inside the university campus only. Yeah. But if you go to the street, and See, to, to yeah, work right, people yeah. work with those people they are all they're, yeah, they are immigrants or, or the children of immigrants and they speak Spanish so it's a very weird situation no right. and and they know that they realize and they want to and you know actually you, you go to jobs uh people looking it's, for jobs you, very often you're bilingual because you know you, you are losing a, a, a big part of the market international organizations you know things like that and, and most of them is, is called centers right rather than French so right. I mean I don't think they probably in the 80s they connect hmm. also in the 80s probably many Filipinos connect Spanish to the language to, of the elite to be honest that elite already died and and well, I just saw I think most of the family the now day. they don't speak Spanish yeah no I, I I see what you're saying no, I'm just saying maybe I'm talking about like um, general collective consciousness I think there's I mean, you told me, right? Like he's one of your students only said, you know, I'm glad to see a kind Espanol, right? <laughs> or something like that. You know, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like there's still that I, lingering I, I, sense of Spain as this overbearing, arrogant people or something like that. Which is, of course, the view. Yeah. This is the yeah. view. This is the view of educated people in the Philippines. Mm. But if you belong to the, to the people who wants to belong to, to middle class, no? People ah, who, because, you know, saying. they don't have this... Yeah, no bad. They, they didn't get that information. Yeah, they don't have that baggage. I see what right? you're saying. They just see the, you know, educated people in the Philippines, people like you actually, right. have that view. Uh, usually, people who come from the province, you know, a, a person who comes from Panay to Manila to learn Spanish, they, they, they don't have that, those, those, those ideas, really. Interesting, very interesting. But of course, yeah. we in middle class, we also matter, right? <laughs> because we are the intelligentsia in all of the country, right? So you have to win us over too, right? But I see what you're saying. Yes. You're saying that it's it's those yes, who yes. are to read Rizal and, and go into the national discourse, they're the ones who have this chip on their shoulders when they deal with Spain. While uh, uh, Juan de la Cruz has no issue with Spain. Spain is just another foreign language you want to learn for practical purposes. I see exactly what you're saying. Yes. See what you're saying, yeah, they, yeah. They they know something about the history. They know that yeah, the Castillas were bad and things whatever. like that. But they also they also see that it's a it's an easy language to learn for Filipinos, you know. Yeah. Right? And, and it's, it's, a, it's a language that you can you can speak with 600, 600 million people. So it's, it's useful. It's a it's a useful investment. Yeah, and it it could probably help you in other you know the, in in artistic dating and other ways too. I mean, if you can speak. French or Italian or Spanish, right? I mean, yeah, to, be honest, to be honest, Richard, what you told me that you go to Spain and you feel more comfortable there than in other countries is something that happened to many Filipinos, right? They tell me they come back and and they tell me the same, right? You know, That's like true, you know, yeah. they feel they feel they feel they feel okay there. Yeah, they don't feel uh, uh they don't feel so foreign. That's the term. Exactly. I mean, I'm a, I'm a foreigner. I don't yeah. feel so foreign, so foreign, which which is true, right? I mean, we are culturally more similar than we are willing to to admit, right? And sometimes, and I think the language barrier is something that 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 uh, is the reason for that, no? Right. I think it's a, it's a language barrier. Yeah, but but the barriers are hopefully coming down and all. I mean, tomorrow I, I'm hoping to talk to the you know to uh, Manolito Paterna, good friends of ours, who's actually based in Madrid, and we're going to talk also about the situation of OFWs in Madrid. I know him. I know him. I know him. He's a good guy. I know I, exactly. He also had great things to say about you, so I really appreciate both of you. That's why I said I'm going to talk to you guys back to back, right? Because the, one of the things I think we will have to do is. Also, <laughs> Um, help Filipinos in Spain to learn proper Spanish, not uh, calle, cal calle Spanish, but proper Spanish so that, you know, they can have more upward mobility. Because that's also what I notice in Italy, for instance. There are a lot of Filipinos there, but the Italian they speak is more the Italiano. You know, it gets you 
going during the day, but it's not the kind of Italian that puts you in newspapers as journalista or you know periodista or put you, you know what I'm saying, right? So so you're right. Spanish is easy to pick up for us Filipinos, but we have to do more to help Filipinos, including those in Spain, to learn really um you know proper <laughs> Spanish that they can use in the bank, in university, in periodista, whatever, right? So so I think that's that's one of the challenges we have. I, I don't know if you know, but 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 we have this uh, program that yes. is especially specific to, to Filipinos, no? Yeah, so it's it's Spain, right? Spain wants well, well, Filipino people to to go to our high schools and they teach English to our children. So that's excellent, no? Excellent. And many of them, many of them come 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 back to the Philippines, and it's a very it's a very good thing because they they go to another culture, they get exposed to real to real Spain. They go. They teach Spanish in towns, in cities, all over the, all, the whole territory program? of Spain. No. Program? They, what is this program? Okay, program? The the, the name? Uh, the, the, or uh, they they go to they go to to Spain for during three years to teach Spanish to teach English. Yeah, is it the uh, auxiliary? What's the name of the program? Que que nombre? The 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 nom the auxiliary. Auxiliares de conversación. Yeah, yeah. Auxiliares yeah. de yeah, conversación. Yeah. Right, right, right. I thank you for pointing that oh, out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so from you know from all the countries of the world, Spain said, okay, okay, let's bring Filipinos to do that. Why not? Yes. Right. And we don't discriminate. You know, other countries would say, why Filipinos? Why don't better people from US or UK? No. For us it's fine. Right. Filipinos yeah. speak very good English. So what's right. the point? Right? And they're so, friendly, uh, nice. I think people. it's a good it's, Yeah. Friendly, nice people. A, I, mean, it's, all I that. think it's a very right. It's a very good program, and people come back to the Philippines, and it's good. You know, they they usually usually speak good things about Spain, about the Spanish people. It's a good way to to you know to know each other, deba. Right? Yes, and also the same. Yeah, people, the Spanish tourists that come here, then they come back, they repeat, they like they like the experience. So exactly. uh, you know, but to be <laughs> honest, there is a real need each other to know better, right? To to, to know better each other, right? right. Definitely. Yes, I agree with mm -hmm. that. Wow, I think we did mm -hmm. two hours at least. <laughs> uh, I was exactly like, yes. <laughs> two hours. Wow. and it just you know, just like a breeze. No, I mean, just the time just breezed away. I mean, it, which just shows that we have to have more of this conversation. I mean, hopefully, more in person in the future, on the record, off the record. So, for me, one of the best ways to get to know people is to get to know their mind, their what they're interested in, how they're interested in things, and and I appreciate. I mean, we were we have been friends for a long time, but I would, I would say our friendship is has entered a different level. Hopefully, after this conversation, even if it's online. So, I mean, I hope I to. Hope so. I hope so too. Yeah, I hope to see you soon yeah. and continue this conversation. And for me, I mean, I'm a generally skeptical person. I cover politics. How can you not be skeptical? But I I always try not to be cynical. And but when it comes to Philippines and Spain, I don't know. Maybe I'm just being sentimental. But I have a sense that things will are going to move in a better direction. I think Filipinos were. Finally, getting over with our American, America is the whole world, you know, kind of mentality. And we're opening up to more cultures and more countries, including in Asia, with China, with Russia, in the Middle East, and hopefully also more with Spain. And I hope this relationship can start on a different footing, way better than it, it did in the past century. So thank you very much for your effort, Amigo. And hopefully I can see you soon. We can continue this conversation. I hope I didn't tire you too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was, it was a, a real, you know, engaging and, and conversation. I really like it. Uh, it was, I really enjoyed it. Oh, no problem. I just, okay. I'm very happy that we finally have a, a long conversation, actually, because, you know, uh, chatting is not the same. No? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. It was a very uh, stimulating uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you for inviting Thank me. Thank you very much, amigo, and hopefully see you soon. God bless. Adios. Yeah, see you soon. Bye bye.